Victor, and then I right now, Victor. So don't uh, okay. <laughs> don't give away any of don't the Canadian. Don't give away any Canadian <laughs> secrets. Um, All right. Hang on. Uh, I'm pretty sure we're live. Um, but, 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 yep, we're live. All right, here we go. Welcome everybody to uh, the very Sweet. special edition of Gabin and Games with Good Sir Victor Lucas. You guys all know Victor Lucas. He uh, hosts the Game Awards. He was on G4. He was on Game Trailers. And oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm no, thinking no, of Jeffrey. Guy. I'm thinking guy. of Jeffrey. That's right. You're the Canadian Brian Adams. Actually, <laughs> he is Canadian. You know what was weird, Victor? Yeah, I saw that the Canadian folks got together and did a uh, uh, "We Are the World" song too, with Brian Adams and Loverboy, and I didn't even yes, know about this did. until yeah, a couple yeah. of months ago. Was that a big There's, hit over there, or no? Oh yeah, it was. You know, the 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 secret about Canadians is that we grow up with uh, socialized medicine, socialized yeah, uh, education. Know. And all the media that America can uh, ingest or, or or send out to us, so we become um, uh, very knowledgeable in the ways of how media yes. gets created, and uh, it, sort of the tastes of people. And that's why there's so many people from this relatively small country that can find a way to uh, relatively small a country. Voice. Well, it's yeah. a big country with a small population. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, listen, you guys gave us Alanis. So, you know, Alanis and uh, John Candy, all the good comedy comedians come from up there, too. I wonder what that's about. What's the theory? Uh, Eugene uh, Levy? It, yeah, it's the, uh, I think it's a pretty decent education system. And I think it's, I know. Uh, it, it, you know, consuming all of this content that America happily provides for North Americans. And Smart so people are, are funnier, right? I, I think you need to have a little bit of empathy and a little bit of intelligence and uh, a little bit of comfort and safety. And I think Canada no, it, I it does help to provide a little bit of those foundational building blocks. I know I benefited from it. Uh, my mom was broke. We grew up on welfare, but I had a great education in Vancouver. And, and if and, you got uh, sick, you just you went know, right. and you were OK. Yeah, I mean, it, that's a, a little rose-colored glasses type look at it because yeah. there are long wait lines. and, and That's the only kind of glasses and... we can afford. Our eye care is not covered, so we just, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, I... we, uh, we, we tend to think of other people in our country, and I think oh that also God. makes Canada very good with collaborative work on movies and TV shows and video games. And, yeah, we're, uh, we're, what, we got issues know. here. I'll tell you what. Well, it's good oh, to have yeah, you, Victor. You know what? I, I've worked out a lot out of America and what I respect out of America is good ideas get given a shot, you know, and people come from all over the world and from all kinds of backgrounds and disciplines to America and investments are made in ideas and in people and good ideas bubble up and you can. Come okay. From, but, like, okay. But, but that's, I that's sold, my, little... the first people I sold my show to were Americans. The sure. But that's people. a little rose colored then, as well. Right. Because sure, yeah, it's yeah. not good ideas they're investing in. It's the fact that they want more ducats for themselves. And, oh, and, yeah, and no, a good no. idea will lead to that for sure. Yeah. If it's yeah. executed well, but it's not it's not like a uh, out of the kindness of Americans heart. We just love good ideas over here. Uh, it's well, you know, Americans are smart enough to know that good ideas lead to ducats. That's true. And that's the very, difference. very true. Yeah. In Canada, it's a much more reserved kind of. Is it working over there? Is it working over there? Well, maybe we can, like, we are launching a Law & Order show uh, in Canada. Law & Order Toronto, which is exciting. It's cool. From but the it's actual like, Law & Order brand or a yeah, new? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Which is great. I think it's very yeah. exciting. It, there's it, Law & Order has been on the air, what, like for 85 years, years in yeah. America? <laughs> so it's, right. it, now's the perfect time. We're going to make That's a right. Canadian version of that. You know? There you go. There, every, every, <laughs> sta every city gets one. It's just, yeah. it's, it's in the new, uh, when Trump gets elected again, it's going to be, that's, that's the reason I'm voting for him is because every, <laughs> every state gets or city gets their own law and order. Okay. Before <laughs> we really get into the questions and talking about Victor, uh, let me know if there's any sound issues, guys, we're doing this over on Streamlab, uh, stream yard. So sometimes that's a little finicky, but also okay. let me let you guys know at the top, uh, member chats, super chats, um, questions for Victor are great. I will be getting those towards the end of the show though. So if you've paid or if you are a member and you're like, what the fuck I'll get them. But I want to talk to Victor first. He's my boyfriend. Leave me alone. And <laughs> listen, uh, we'll get to that. Also, let's just deal with the elephant in the room real quick. Cause I already got some questions about Tommy Tallarico, your friend, my friend, your old co-host. Yep. Um, I'm a huge fan of Tommy. I got nothing but good things to say about Tommy. I know there's a lot of weird shit out there going on, uh, with speculation and 
Has there, there been some is, stuff? There has yeah. been some stuff, and I I'm not I I I'm I don't want to go in. I mean, you know, I'd love to have Tommy on one day. I know right now he's you know dealing with you know helping out a bunch of stuff and taking care of a bunch of stuff. But you know, I I would say I think he's gotten smeared and gotten a bad rap. Uh, you know, I went down to Irvine. I played the Amico. I saw it. I talked to Tommy. This was not a, uh, a lot of people thinking it was some kind of scam. This was a real thing. He had passion in his heart. Uh, he wanted to make this fucking thing go. And sometimes the, sometimes the dreams don't work, but well, I don't think it was thing with Tommy. man. Here's my thing with Tommy. And I'm sure everybody's got questions about it. Tommy is very capable of communicating about what's going on for him and mm -hmm. with his projects and his life by himself and for himself and i don't think it does any service to him or to no. his fans or his followers or his haters for other people to just add to the pylon and so Absolutely. i've chosen to just distance myself from the the conversation um but uh you know what i will but say you are still good with tommy tallarico yeah he's my friend and and Me i care too. about him and and uh, I want the best for him, and it sucks that he's gone through some stuff. But uh, uh, you know, the, the this is a this is a world that likes this kind of salacious material, and it it uh, it happens over and over again, and. Uh, mistakes are, can be made and and the, you know what's interesting is people like to relitigate mistakes and use that and there's such a propagation of hatred around all of these different types of services and platforms that we have and and uh it becomes a business decision for a lot of people that that's the kind of stuff that they want to work in and that ain't me you know right and so i just say you have that that's fine and I'm going to be over here doing what I've always done, which is reviewing video games and interviewing people that are incredibly creative and ambitious and celebrating right. the light that people try to put into the world. Okay. So I want to ask you about that. I mean, I definitely want to get to yeah. your big news and, and we'll get to that in a couple of minutes. Um, but I got to go right to that because you brought it up because there is something really refreshing and also curious about the cut of your jib when it comes to the way you deal with being online perpetually and being a video game ambassador, basically. Um, yeah. Which is, you know, everything from that particular attitude, uh, which is more like, let's just stay positive to, uh, you know, you, you, you don't seem to be, uh, diving into the culture war stuff for that much, you know, you, you, you seem to be pretty much, um, just sort of like what you were like on TV. And I, I, my question is on one hand, that's wonderful. And on the other hand, have you struggled now that you're off TV, which I would imagine is more of a, of a, of a kind of a PG rated world, now you're in a mm. world of niche and niche of niche content and clickbait rage and all of this stuff. Yeah. You guys have a little empire going on over there with the shows that you do. And Electro Playground is stronger than ever now in a lot of ways with the announcement we're about to talk about. But yeah. where do you fit in now? Do you find that you guys have uh, can, can work and live in this world? Or does it feel like people are like, who is this guy always being nice and shit? Uh, I think there has been a question about who is this guy all the way along, you know, and um, uh, I have never sort of put on airs that people would know me as a brand or as the, you know, uh, you know, some personality with all of this stuff. I'm a conduit to a world that I love and adore. And I know that a lot of the viewership really does as well. And I also think about the people watching this material not just as the commentators not just as the people that are going to like i always think about the negativity that i read even on the stuff that i put out there you know someone's always got a comment on stuff and sometimes it's absurdly rude and i go i always ask who the hell has the energy and the mentality to take the time to write that bullshit like who has the time to sit down and complain about this specific thing what a failing on that person's part to oversimplify and reduce all of the work that they've just watched, even in my review video or whatever, to add more caustic bullshit into the world. 
And I'm always aware of that and I, that it's a ridiculous expenditure of energy. And I'm also aware that that is a very small contingent of who is watching and who is out there. And I think about myself and my friends and the people that I know and love in my world. Are they taking time to write terrible things on the Internet over people's work or about people's choices or about people's lives? No, they're not. And most people don't, you know, and I think we do get caught up in chasing these trends and whatever is hot and thinking that, OK, well, this is important right now. So we must comment on that. We must add our voice. And I, I think we're learning over and over again that these echo chambers are not serving anybody except for the people that are reaping the advertisement over the collection of all of this aggregate nonsense and all of this this bubbling cauldron of hate. And it's really not applicable to video games. And that's the way that I really look at it. Video games are an escapism art form. It's a beautiful, optimistic, ambitious way to, you know, find a way to communicate and connect with a, a, a fan base and an audience out there. They're an impossible dream, every single one of them. And they can disappoint us. They can let us down. But, you know, when you look at it holistically, it's incredible that we get this as something to engage in and have fun with. I would never lose sight of that. It's ridiculous and crazy to get so animated and so volatile and so angry about something that is ephemeral and fun and, and uh, you know, meant and b built out of joy and a, a, a degree of passion and, and hopefulness, you know, and then we boil it down to, it doesn't have this feature. It doesn't have like the sports game things. Like every time I review a sports game, it's just loaded with comments about what the, the, the stats are wrong. The card is wrong. They're using the same animations. It's like, Jesus Christ, man, it costs less to buy this game than it does to go and buy a ticket to go and see a real sports game in, in life. And I encourage everybody to do that because it's really fun to go and see sports in reality. But it's really fun to just get lost in this sports game and play it with your buddy, even if it is using recycled pieces of content, even if within that nine month space, all of those human beings that built that weren't able to completely redefine everything from last year's game, which is based on reality to begin with, you know, but still we are, we're existing in this world where everything comes out and we're just expecting a percentile of people to spend their energy to hate. And, uh, I don't, and I don't think EP would have been created if that was my mentality to begin with. Oh you know? yeah. I think back then for sure. I, I wonder now if you could go to a network, not, not that you'd want to go to a network, but you could go to a network mm. and be like, I want to be totally, you know, uh, David, uh I think it's Jerry missing, Springer. Man. What's that? I think it's missing. I think, what? I think that kind of commentary and that kind of discussion and, and that connection with creators is absurdly, um, missing and lacking in media <laughs> right now. What about though, when you say video games are escapist, right? I mean, one of the mm -hmm. things that maybe comes with the, uh, uh, adolescence and or adulthood of the medium is that it is now, uh, whether you're talking indie games, you're talking the, you know, Eve's Gilmont quadruple games <laughs> like skull and bones. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it is now able to it always was but it is now willing and able to take in more adult thematics and politics and things that don't necessarily read to people like you and i who maybe came up playing super star wars or sonic or mario or whatever uh it doesn't read like just escapism depending on who you are and what game you're playing i mean do, do right. you find like how do you square that then with the fact that there are going to be works of art in video games that do upset people and make people angry. Is that of not a valid point of discussion in the realm of the content you create? I, you know, I think it's totally fine to have a, a, um, an aversion or have some, some, your emotions are always valid. Absolutely. Right. Um, and your opinions are always valid. I totally, absolutely believe that as well. I also think that games have matured a tremendous amount. I think the, uh, uh, the corner we turned was with Grand Theft Auto three and the satire that Rockstar put into mm. that. And it really became this evolutionary step for 3d game development and everything changed, I think in games after Grand Theft Auto three, there were so many people, chasing that as an opportunity to create open world 
experiences, but then we saw a stacking on on uh, more mature kinds of concepts and and uh, a lot more nuance, a lot more subtlety. And we need that. Absolutely. I, and I'm not trying to say that we can just look at this as childish, you know, light, you know, work out there. But I think there needs to be this kind of I, I don't know. And who am I to say I, that? The well, world you're a guy who's been doing it, it and delivering the message successfully for 20 years, 22 years or 95, think, right? Yeah, for a long time. Uh, but I think the idea is just to have a little bit of perspective and just to appreciate, you know, the efforts that people make and uh, to enjoy what you enjoy and, and, and not spend all your time being angry about it in a direction and trying to ruin other people's enjoyment of stuff, you know, but have you, you know found what? that a challenging environment to bring that positivity into the internet in terms of EP and, and the, the overall network of your couple of different shows there? Has that been challenging to sort of take that high ground and still be as successful as you need to be and want to be? I just do what I do, David. I don't think about no, no, it. No, you know, I, I I'm not, I'm not, yeah. well, I, yeah, but I want you to think about it. That's what I'm asking. Well, it, if I it, did think about it and, and if it did concern me, then I would just specify and I would just work with the YouTube algorithm and just decide that this is what I'm going to do now because this is what's going to work for the views and the clicks. And I don't think like that. And, um, because I don't, why I don't you a, think like that? Because I had the privilege of being able to ask ask uh, people about their work across a wide spectrum of no no why don't you have the necessity to think like that like for me it's, I made a decent amount of, it, of money David. what's yeah, that that's part that's part of that though it, it you know I had this opportunity to go and and connect with all kinds of people on different types of projects and different disciplines that kept me sane I think and that's that's also what I do now is try to not just you know, drill down on one specific thing and one specific game type and one specific, like I can't stream all day. I can't play the same game all day. Mm -hmm. I need to break it up and talk with people that are in animation and movies and, and, uh, you know, go and see these things and play games and play retro stuff and try a bunch of different things so that I can right. come back and come with all of these perspectives. And now that is the work that I do, but it also gives me a perspective across all of it. You know, I don't give a crap about what's going on with other YouTubers or what, what, you know, if there's sure. I think are, yeah. I hear you, but what I'm asking and, and I'll just be clear on it. Maybe I wasn't um, like, I, I made some good money in my industry before I started doing this. Yeah. So as much as I would love for my channel to be self-sustainable, it's not right. Yeah. Is it because you and I are financially privileged because of our past success where we don't have to worry about that as much? Or is it that you're like, dude, we're successful enough. I could be a lot more successful if I got down in the mud, but I don't want to get down in the mud. Or I'm only asking because I know a lot of people mm. watching. It's like sometimes you can hear people right. like me or people like you sort of it's talking about of the privilege. success. and. Right. But not everybody has the opportunity to hit YouTube and be positive because they don't have that cushion that maybe you have or I have. I think you're boiling that down to it's it's too simple, too simple to okay. just say to, to be positive. Mm -hmm. I think the idea is find the things that that you really groove on and go out and project that out into the world. And through okay. that opportunities come, you know, and that's been the okay. case for me my whole career. People right. like working with me because I don't bring a whole bunch of extra baggage to the discussion and to the table. And, and whether that's a calculated move on my part or whether that's just the way that I exist doesn't really matter in the context of people giving you opportunity and wanting to kind of uh, connect with you and, and want to work with you because they, they also don't want to take in all of that stuff as well. And if you're cognizant of that in the work that you put out into the world, then I think that, that bounces around and people may through you know boil it down to something incredibly simple or he's a nice guy or he's very he's very positive and that might be incredibly reductive but if there's a truth to what that you know that 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 is being projected out there there's also an attraction to say well it's that's a simple solution for me to work with this person or to be interviewed by this person or whatever. Um, and I, I'm saying just be truthful to yourself and go to bed at night happy with what you're putting out there. And okay. I don't know if a lot of people are 
I don't know because I don't do it, but I don't know if a lot of people are that spend all day, you know, complaining about wokeness or, or, right. you know, ragging on other people's decisions and other people's channels and saying this game sucks and that game sucks. Like, I don't know. Like, I, I, I don't yeah, I, think I, I would if I, that's what I was doing all day. I think I'd be like, Jesus, you know, I feel like if you're putting out misery, how do you not have that infect you? And how do you know? Oh, I think I think you misery? do. I think the reason maybe I press on it, Victor, is that you and I came from a generation of entertainment where uh, or or PR entertainment or interviews or whatever, where it was very um, baby proofed. You know, all the corners were, you know, it's like these are the questions mm. you can ask this, you know. And I think one of the good and bad things that's come with just the openness of the Internet and things like live streaming and podcast and all that stuff is there is an expectation of a, I, I don't want to say genuineness because that feels like it's something noble, but there's an expectation of a more relatable sense of uh, the way things are presented, I think. And in that, that's why I'm fascinated by your journey as it's gone from traditional media to new media, because right. you're, you're sort of swimming in that muck, but you don't, that's not you, you know, it kind of reminds just, me of like the talk shows in America anyway, where it was like all the sensationalists. And then Oprah finally said, yeah, I don't want to do that anymore. And she's like, right. I want to stay on the, or on Donahue. the, oh, yeah. oh I, I used to love fucking Donahue. Right? Nobody even knows yeah. who Donahue is anymore. And, and um, I think those people had the perspective. I think they, they looked around and said, this is a privilege. This is how I feel about it. And it, it's an honor to be able to talk to creative people creativity okay. is the spark that we should all aspire to we wake up Got going it. okay what am i going to throw out in the world i've always just been very grateful that i've had the opportunity to have access to people i'm inspired by them when i have their conversations mm -hmm. and i want those conversations to inspire other people if all we're doing is being negative about every decision and every choice uh, that people make in the in pursuit of creativity what are we doing you know, I mean, we're just making it easier for machines to take it all over. You know, if we're just right. Well, that's I mean, that's coming about, anyway. I know, but if you talk about round in the edges, it it's right. uh, you know, like I think we're in our aspiration to all become critics of everything. That's what we're doing. You know, mm. we're just working our way towards. Well, you didn't like this. You didn't like that. You didn't like this. You didn't like that. Well, you know what? Press a button and it'll make exactly what you want for you. Go for it. And I no wonder about that. Let's talk about that. Let's forget the negative positive. Let's talk about yeah. that. I mean, we are, I don't know if you saw Google did a, uh, a video game text to video game tool, which has not been released to the public yet, but you can see gifs and videos online and stuff. And it's very rudimentary. It's very basic. It's ba it makes a 2d platformer that would have barely, you know, uh, uh, gotten a two out of 10 review, uh, back in Mario, 85 days, you know, right, right. But, yeah. you know, look at where it's AI coming. art was, you know, a yeah. year ago, and now we're text to video. And a lot of people can't tell the difference between a real video and not. So, I mean, what about that, though? Is that a bad thing? Not the negative stuff. But is it a bad thing that if it's like, you know, and I really like Spider Man and Indiana Jones, I know there's very few ways they could come together. But computer make me a movie with Spider Man and I want it to be Tobey Maguire and I want it to be Indiana Jones Harrison Ford when he was Raiders age, make yeah. me something good. I mean, is that is that bad? You know what the, this is really a question about, David? I think it's a question about the time, the actual physical allotment of time. And you and I are old enough to kind of reconcile with that every goddamn day. Yeah. But there's a finite amount of it, you yes. know? And I certainly am very aware of that in every game that I'm reviewing these days. I've tweeted about it and you've retweeted a little bit about it too. Like, especially as we're going into this world of subscription based services mm -hmm. and stuff like that, we need to get into it right away. Like yeah. I loved like a dragon, uh, the most infinite wealth. I was streaming it. It took hours of the same shit over and over and over and over again before it started to like really start to crescendo. And as I was streaming it, I'm like, God damn, let's, go you know i'm saying i'm thinking about that with the halo show we only have a little bit of time we only do every one of us you know and if we are waiting for this shit to get to us for too long that is the that is the opportunity for ai 
because AI and us being able to build our own little trinkets and toys to to monk around with and play around with and and play or watch or whatever, that's just taking your time. That's what I'm worried about is that we're going to build these little bullshit things that only will be built for us, which will be cute and funny and, and interesting, but they're going to suck your time. They're going to pull your time away and you won't have time to work and play and see the other things that like artists really labored, labored over and really tried to craft something unique and special and, and uh, worth your actual time. And that's what I'm really concerned about is we're going to be given all like we already have too much. You know, you and I know this. We've come from an era where there was immense channel <laughs> constriction. It was very right. difficult to build a cartridge or a, or a CD-ROM based experience or whatever. And there were a lot less channels, all of that. You know, we came from a generation where it was like it was easy to track everything and we would see yep. almost everything. And most and, people watch uh, the same stuff. I mean, and most people watch the same stuff. And now everybody's got their own thing and their own viewpoint on what is what they're into. And we spend half of our time in our own little world. And then the other half of the time on our apps, making commercials about what we like so that maybe somebody else will dig that, you know, whether it's TikToks or or tweets or whatever, we're all just blasting. I'm playing this. I'm doing that. I'm doing that. And so we're all siloed in a bunch of different directions. What's AI going to do? It's going to give you more agency to do that. And then what what's that going to do with the amount of time you have? It's going to siphon it right down. And so I think this, you know, a, uh, ongoing thing that's happening right now with uh, all of these layoffs, all of these upheavals across games, but across every industry right now is a, yeah. an acute awareness on the part of bean counters and executives recognizing that the uh, uh, we're, we're going to have some real time battles, you know, we're, we're going to have a, you know, a, there's going to be a lot of battles about a lot of other things, but there's going to yep. be a lot of battles for people's time. And I saw and a I, tweet from, about. I want to say it's the guy who runs game industry biz. I think his name's yeah. Chris something. Um, and he was listing out the top 10 service games and he's like the only one that's come in to the top 10 in, in a long time is power world. He's like, which really shows the challenge of people who were trying, like even Warner brothers yesterday were like, okay, we're going to walk away from triple a. I'm sure you so saw that. Stupid. And yeah. it's like, that was the biggest game of the year. What are you doing? But anyway, you know, Potter. was there a Harry With Potter Hogwarts. game? Yeah. But yeah. But the, 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 the tweet was like going, you know, once you are embedded with you and your buddies in a live service game, it, it it's in a Herculean task to pull people away to something new. And so the idea that everyone's throwing their chips on the table for this live service stuff is, I mean, I get it because when it works, it works. And maybe because the way the stock market works it the only winning move is to try that because a, a success like Harry Potter is a one and done, but a success yeah. maybe like hell divers or power world coming into the worlds of the Fortnites becomes a, a perpetual money printing machine. I mean, maybe, maybe that's what it is, but I certainly don't like it. I'm curious though. You're negative on that. So that's mm. what I'm saying. So you will push on things you don't like. It's, it, it's an incorrect perception of you in your right. work that you're always your dick clark of video games you're not yeah. i don't know if that re lands with you that reference but he, he he never complained for the most part on he was all, everything was great no, um, i'm a critic man i i have okay. things that i talk about all the time i was very disappointed with suicide squad you know people paint with a wide brush but i i think what i want to and it drives me a bit crazy to be yeah. you know called as the you know mr nice guy or mr positive about everything tell me I to fuck myself to we'll fix that right now Go fuck yourself with that whole idea. No, why right? don't you stick those toys up your butthole, Victor? No, these are my friends. Oh, okay. Friends. Well, at least you've got some down friends here different from yeah. what I fucking hear. <laughs> you fucking Canadian bacon eating twat motherfucker. Now you push back, push back. Victor. This is how it works. Uh, no, right. Keep man, going. Keep going. No, no, no. Uh, no, yeah. I, I do get negative about the stuff, but I try to coach it with like people tried, you know, and people yeah. are trying. It's not like the video games industry has figured it out. You know, we're still figuring yeah. it out. It's the it most difficult art form there is. You're pulling it, from it is. every established 
way to communicate and connect with people, every type yeah. of medium out there, painting and everything. And you're trying to build it so that the people will play it and have their own experience. They're a part of the art that they're building. That's why streaming is so popular that. And, and I think it, it connects us, you know, yeah. you know, we don't have the living room connections with games anymore. Well, that's a good point. Other people playing. But uh, it's a really tough thing to do. And I'm aware of that. I'm aware of how hard it is to build something, as you are, to build something with a team is incredibly difficult. And people are just trying. They're trying to figure it out. And the thing that I keep painting for people with them, you know, saying that I just I love everything is like, if I didn't love this business, the show would not have been made. You know, that was yeah. the whole thing. I loved a lot of sectors about video games. I spent a fortune every month on video games. And I read all the magazines and I was like, oh, my God, I love all aspects of this. And that's what I got into fights with all my co-hosts about. You know, they would what do you be mean? very in. Well, they would be into a specific thing. It would be too kitty or this is not for me and be like, well, don't you see this? I mean, it, like I remember fighting about Kotar and, and uh, Homeworld and. Uh, you know, even Uncharted Three with Scott Jones, it's like he just, he didn't see the, uh, you know, he didn't have as much of a romantic connection to the Indiana Jonesness of it that I right. did, but also the, uh, you, you know, I like two better than three, but I like the ambition of three and that Naughty Dog was trying to just keep growing and growing and deliver all of these new elements to this experience. So I loved it, and he was like, eh, six and a half, and I was like, ah, you know. But right. that's fine. Those those yeah, opinions yeah. are great. And there's a lot of people that share those opinions, whether it was Tommy, whether it was Scott, whether it was any of our, our other. I mean, one there. could argue as it relates to Uncharted. And it's actually kind of interesting to me because I'm a huge Indiana Jones fan. Well, yeah, I was. <laughs> the last I loved Dial of Destiny, bro. I loved it. I loved it. It's not a it's no it's no crystal skull, but I, it, I, I loved it. I love I, you know indie? what I love about it, especially no. as a guy that's getting older, is that it, this is a, a movie that shows the validity and the power and the importance of education and also a, a, an older person in a, an adventure story. They're not done quite yet, you know, and Harrison sure, Ford that's embodies great. all that. Make it a good and adventure I, story, though. I loved you know. it. I thought, Listen, I thought it would great. you have rather had that or would you have rather had them just continue the opening 20 minutes and make a two hour movie out of that? Because I could have watched the fuck out of the opening of Dollar Dust. I Destiny. wanted all of it. I, yeah. I think it's I think it's stupid for like, especially because we're in the midst of battles about CG performers and AI and yeah. all that shit right now. Just go for it, man. You got the biggest star in Hollywood history across yeah. all of these different movies. We would all love to see Harrison Ford in games and hear him and in movies and in TV shows. A lot like, of people why wouldn't. Isn't they there say, a Blade oh, Runner if TV he dies, show? if he dies, I don't want to. I mean, obviously, it should be up to him. It should be his, his, yeah. his you know, but yeah. I, I also think they should fucking recast Indiana Jones. I mean, I'm cool with that, too. I'm cool with yeah. that, too. I mean, but, give you me know, more. He, he doesn't want to leave the role. He wants to be remembered as the guy. I appreciate and, that, but I'm like, hey, yeah. you're one guy. You've created this know, beloved fucking thing. But anyway, <laughs> what about yeah. indie games? Do you? I, I I watch your content. I know you cover. Like I watched your uh, some of the the rocket ship. What was your rocket ship awards? Rocket and Reagan awards. And and you your your favorite game last year was like Spider Man Two, correct? Yes, it is. Yeah. Okay. So, yep. but do do you trade in the indie games? Like I find a lot of the audience is very dismissive of some of the most interesting games out there, I guess, because of budget. I mean, is that something you've encountered or not really? I've, I've loved your contributions and I didn't, I didn't spend the time this year to go out to everybody. I was back and forth. I was really on the fence about doing the awards this year because last year was so freaking good mm. and it, it just felt like, what right. It's, it a, matter? it's ridiculous. They're all right. So good. Yeah. Every yeah. game was good. You know, they're, they're all game of the years, you know, yes. and then I was back and forth and then I thought, okay, you know what? I'm going to do this because the, the viewers of our content really like that, but I'm going to just ask them to talk about stuff. And it actually ended up being a really nice show. Um, but I loved your contributions and your discussions around indie games. One of the things that people don't give you enough credit for is yeah. how intelligent you are at dissecting all kinds of game styles and how open to any kind of game experience that might c cross your way, whether it's live service, whether it's a, uh, cause I know you love that dragon flying game, which I haven't had time to play, but, uh, oh, uh yeah, you, yeah. you love indie games, you love, and you're always looking at obscure titles and bubbling them up. And it's always from a point of appreciating the 
design ethos and the philosophies behind the play. And I think that's really important and very valuable. I don't know if enough people give you credit for that, but it's something right. that I totally recognize in the work that you do. Well, I appreciate yes, that. I do play them, but I don't okay. always have time to make content about them because I'm still editing a lot. And yeah. editing is, it just is a day eater. That's another reason oh, why I know. I'm very cognizant of game of time, you know, yeah. because I work really hard. Like I, I work really hard to play this shit. So I know what I'm talking about and then edit content that I'm, I'm putting together to try to make it as TV like as possible. It takes a long ass time. So I do play do, them. Do you find, do you ever, cause I, 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 I want to ask you about that. Um, and again, it's, I'm, I'm on your time here, so I don't know what you're, you know, cause I could talk to you for hours on this stuff. Cause I, I'm, <laughs> When you talk about editing more like TV, right? So like I've yep. been doing a lot of live streaming. I still love live streaming, but I, yep. I, I finally got, you know, my stubborn brain finally realized whether my message is good, bad, or average, it's going to be better served if I can edit it and, and really kind of control what yep. I'm trying to explain and then do the live shows for things like this and whatnot. Um, but with your stuff, because it is so edited heavy, um, and your stuff is so slick and so well produced. Do oh, you, thank you? Well, you're welcome. But is it worth it on a place like YouTube, which in Twitch, like, do you think th the time spent to really get the sleek editing that was demanded back in, in, you know, when we were coming up, do you yeah. think that time is, are you going, yeah, you know what? It, it, it I, the audience loves it I and or i want to do it and i don't want to do anything else even if I it's not worth with it. that all the time i do and i know that we are not just battling youtube we're battling tiktok and yeah. the, the immediacy of that and instagram and all these other things we're all being served these minute long things whether we want to or not you know they're yeah. all working youtube is as well so I'm aware of that and I see value in building good stuff there too. And I like doing that and that takes time as well. Yeah. But the thing that I always come back to is that I'm reviewing these things that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to make by sometimes up to a thousand people. And I'm playing these games and I'm spending real time playing them. Is it cool for me to just come off of that and not have any of the footage and not have any of the, you know my points illustrated and backed up? and just jump right into some kind of live, which I think there is some value in that, but I feel like I'm also like, I'm, I'm signing my name and I'm going, okay, that game is done. I did it. You know, I put the whole package together. I spent all that time playing it. I spent all that time putting my thoughts together on it. Am I happy with it? I am. Let me put that out there. What do you and think so is the best there. review you've done in the last 12 months ethos? Uh, I th not in terms I mean, of the I, best game, but your best analysis and presentation. Uh, and I, I never think like that, but that's a good question. I, one that immediately comes to mind is my, cause I don't usually make the time for it, but when the last of us part two came out, it really rocked me. Like I thought that the, game was, the remaster or no, back the, in the, day? the first time in 2020. Okay. And, and, and it may have been because the pandemic was upon us and that, right. it was just all, all of the story of that coming out then was just insane, but that game rocked me. I didn't know where we were going with it. I didn't, you know, check in on all the leaks and all that shit. So I just played the right. game and I'm like, oh, I was so angry and so upset. And then I played through it and I did my non-spoiler review. Wait, you were angry fine. and upset. Why? Because of the narrative or what? What? Yeah. Yeah. Because of the choices. But then I fell in love with the game and it's, it's, you know, difficult ask of you as a player and the okay. brazenness and the, and the quality of of all of it, you know? And, uh, so I put a, not, uh, I put a spoilery thoughts on, on 10 reasons why I think the game is a masterpiece. And I know that's going to set off alarm bell bells for a lot of people out there. A lot of people love to hate that game, but just as a creative work and right. the, the balls on naughty dog and Sony to spend all that money to make something that felt like an indie thing, but with the biggest budget in the world in terms of creative risk, <laughs> right. it's like, you know, but here's all the money <laughs> and go and make that. Right. And no, knowing they were going to piss everybody off and they effectively did that. Uh, but I was still really drawn in and I did like at the core of it was just a game that was really fun to play, even though it was brutal and, you know, oftentimes disgusting and disturbing. But I put another video together kind of outlining uh, why I thought it was a masterpiece. It was the first time I really kind of played with 
the the sound mix a little bit more and mm -hmm. taking more pauses and breaks and i illustrated all the thing it was i, I don't script my stuff very mm -hmm. often i just roll off the top of my head and you do too and it, it's a challenge to be clear and to get to all the things that you're thinking about in a take or a couple of takes um but I did a pretty good job there, and I, I think I did a pretty good job on the edit, and I feel I feel pretty good about that as oh, an that's illustration. Good. That's great. Yeah, I, I started a new thing the other day where I was recording, and it almost feels like writing papers back in college now, where I have yep. Premiere open and I have yep. my camera open and I have an outline, and and I don't care about the edits, I don't care about the quality of the edits, I just want the information right. So, I, I it literally is like I'll say something, and I'm like I just like that bit. Boop. And I'm, I'm literally editing and filming within seconds of each other, like I'm writing yeah. a paper on a where it's bizarre, but it's enjoyable. It's a lot of fun, man. It must be really gratifying for you, uh, you know, because I know this is a relatively new pursuit for you. To Super become, new. Yeah. Comparatively yeah. speaking. Yeah. But this all it must be a challenge and it must all feel rewarding, especially when you get a, an interview that you're happy with or you get a guest on that you really are, you know, have been looking forward to and it goes well. I, it's it must feel really fantastic that you have this new opportunity to express yourself, you know, and you, you get yeah. the engagement that you do. I, I, I what I love about it, Victor, is and I did the little flourish on your name just to make, you know, people know I'm classy. <laughs> uh, what I love about it is honestly the 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 it, it, it strikes me as like, you know, when you make a video game, like you said, it, it's so hard and you've got so many years, uh, especially if you're yeah. directing it. So you've, it's been incubating in you for a very long time. Yep. And then you've got something like this where it's like, I'm going to try this and you get up and yeah. you try it. It's kind of like when you hear yeah. an actor talk about the immediacy of like being on the stage versus being in a movie that takes totally. three years to shoot to come out. Um, but yeah. I like the connection of it. I'll be honest with you. That was not expected, for, but I love knowing when people say, and I'm sure you get the same thing, and I do want to ask you about fans in a second. Um, but you know, when people say, "Oh, you know, I had a rough day, and I love coming home and turning on your stuff, and just you know, vibing with you guys and vibing with the community," and that was never anywhere in my roadmap when I said I wanted to do this. But when I realized, and people, you know, I don't, I don't want to flowerize it and romanticize it too much, but when I realized when people say, oh, I'm, you know, dealing with depression or I'm dealing with this or I'm struggling with this and it's really cool to have a place. It's like the, 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 the digital version of cheers, you know, where you can just come yeah. and hang out and be with your people. It's kind of cool to facilitate that, you know? I feel the same way. I was very nervous about the, the the kind of live streaming thing. I was very upfront with the viewers that tuned in. And sometimes we had live events at different mm -hmm. venues and stuff, which was really cool. Um, but I was nervous because it's a it was a new challenge. It was a new kind of area to kind of explore. And uh, what I recognized right away is that a, a lot of the people that would tune in had been watching the content for a long time, mm -hmm. you know, and, and there are now are generations of people <laughs> that have been aware of me and and the work that I've done and it does feel incredibly gratifying and and you know for lack of time I would do it way more and and do a lot more live stuff but it is this constant juggle this constant balance I think I think the community builds even if stuff. it's not live it doesn't have to be live to yeah. build that yeah. I mean you know you come home and there's a new episode of of one because you guys have like three shows now right you got Vic, Vic's basement You've got yep. the week, what a week. And then there's another one that sometimes well, I, do, I do reviews on the run. I do like, um, uh, rev like EP features. The rundown is the news thing, which I'd like to do daily, but it's just an editorial impossibility right now. Right. Uh, and, uh, and then I stream uh, on our Twitch channel. I don't put it all right. into YouTube because it seems to monkey with the algorithm i already throw too many different things up there that are you know like youtube doesn't Disparate. know what the hell we are you know well like what about that classic you, stuff I, and new stuff and i everything. read i i saw an interview you did recently with the guy from what is it pnp which is where the classic stuff is going to be living i just put uh, that up yeah i just put yeah that up and it, it, i yeah. i haven't watched the whole thing but what i watched was quite good and quite interesting and one of the things you were talking about was um you know at some point you guys branched off from video games and were going, there's a lot of sort of geek adjacent stuff, you know, movies, yes. comics, yeah. toys, whatever. Yep. And certainly YouTube anyway, uh, rewards the specific, 
right? I mean, have you found that to be challenging to say, maybe we should have electric playground game, electric playground toys as channels or think about that, but you know, it's tough to build one community, let alone a bunch of different ones. And, and, uh, God damn, we are inundated with not just uh, stuff to play and watch and stuff, but like even just setting up to do this interview today. We it's the it's the battle of the apps. The new console yeah. war is how many fucking things want your time. You That's know how right. many how many things do I have to sign into to just go? You yeah. know, and then so I I feel that exhaustion on the part of the viewer too. It's like where like people get pissed that I stream on Twitch. They, they don't want to go to Twitch. They just I don't even under, I get that too, and I'm just like, dude, yeah. it's a just put in your fucking don't even just click the <laughs> link. I don't want to be on Twitch. Which, you're not living there you're just watching a window are you that but selective no, I do with your wish porn that it's like i'm not wasn't. watching porn that comes from that site just it, just <laughs> get the job done and move on clean up and move I do, on i do wish that there wasn't quite Victor, as much you heard i said apathy. clean up and move on it was a cum joke did you get that oh. I well no I say uh, on my delicate Canadian ears I would never know what <laughs> that's that means. right sorry <laughs> continue please I do wish that there wasn't so much apathy from YouTube and Twitch you know I do wish that there was a little bit more curation and mm. um, celebrating stuff that wasn't just the advertorial win for them you know it wasn't just like yeah. we're making bank from this person we love this person I feel like there should be a responsibility on the part of YouTube to kind of figure out what's good for the, you know, the community and the, you know, let's prop some people up, let's get them. And I, I you know, of course yeah. I'm, I'm thinking selfishly, but I, I know, but think there's lots of undiscovered people out there yeah. that are building excellent things that have no hope in hell of getting anything because of, uh, however, you know, I mean, we, we've really just let it all, like we're halfway there to just letting the machines choose everything for us and then build it's everything capitalism, for us. man. I mean, it's, it's a very brutal. Canadian view, which I love, which is, can we make a lot of money, but also do some good. And we yeah. have the money part down with YouTube, but it would be nice if Canada would build their version of YouTube. I'd stream <laughs> on that in a heartbeat. Cause be yeah, another I mean, app. <laughs> I know, but that's, that one's okay. I'll deal with that one. Uh, I had Sessler on, I don't know how much you were, how well, you know, Adam and, and your relationship with Adam, but Adam and you I know Adam, he seems quite angry these days. He, he well, he seems quite like a lot. There's been, he's gone through some stuff. <laughs> he has gone through some stuff. I mean, he, he yeah. had some health challenges in his family and, you know, he openly admitted he was dealing with alcoholism and all this stuff. So, I mean, you know, everybody's got their bag of hammers and that those were his and and i respect yeah. that and i like the guy i think he's smart i think he's uh you know very tuned in but yeah he's he, he's probably angrier he's than smart. i would like to be um yeah. but that said though his relationship with his fans uh from g4 like there's a real uh animosity i think that that built up and some of that i think i think he did openly admit he's like look that was I couldn't help that animosity building because part of it was me and I was, you know, struggling with fame and struggling with, you know, uh, people recognizing me and what did I, ex what did they expect of me and all this stuff? Have you, what has been your relationship? I mean, I know you and Adam, it's not like you're Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt, but you guys are yeah. very well-known figures in the space. I yeah. imagine you get recognized out in the world. Um, Sometimes. what is, what has your relationship been with, with fans and fame that has come from, two decades oh, of man. basically being on the air all the time, whether it's video or uh, YouTube or uh, the TV. Well, it was always unexpected and it continues to be so. And, uh, it, you know, it's, it, it has changed depending on viewership and, and, uh, platforms that I've been a part of. Um, I've always felt especially grateful that people have taken the time to watch the stuff that we've made and, and then also spent, energy to come over and say hello or they want a picture or whatever i feel um you know very um respected and and uh appreciated in, in moments like that and I, and it's it i just feel gratitude you know and uh, i i think that there is a different vibe in america because of how preponderant the the media circus is down there how heavy it is infused in the the kind of culture to stand out in the states and to to be recognized and i think that services like instagram and tiktok mm. have and facebook everything all the apps have really tapped into that psyche in canada we don't have quite that same 
look at me kind of thing around. I mean, I'm sure it's pervasive now because of these social apps and everybody's got a camera all the time. But we in our country, I, I and again, I'm reducing all of this with the, with these thoughts. But I think in our country, it's not that same connection. I noticed it when we would shoot the show because reviews on the run has always been, you know, an externally produced part of our programming we would shoot in all kinds of exteriors right. and when we would shoot outside in in america people would just want to know what we're shooting they want to jump in front of the camera they'd want to be interviewed they'd want to be in our movie you guys shooting a movie that you know, we'd get that all the time you know they people right. would just be running like Times square was hilarious because i mean it, it is anyways but it was insane how many people were just like look at me look what i can do i'm here you know and in canada right. we'd be set up anywhere and people would just walk around and that you know they'd be like don't look at me we did have some girls flash us one time which was kind oh, of nice crazy. but for the most part it will was... that be on the on the new the classic channel the classic stuff <laughs> no it was off camera uh, uh and that's sure canada. it was yeah it's yeah. off that's canada for you you know yeah. in america they'd come up and they would do it in front of the camera in the that's states right. or in canada they would be behind the camera and then they'd run away run away kind of giggling uh but that is kind of the a, a different thing and i think because it's almost training for americans to think about fame like that we're it's constantly reinforced that yeah. fame is difficult and it's hard and and it's in all every interview with every famous person how do you deal with all the the attention and the fame and it's it feels like that's part of the american condition like a part of the way of life you know you know here, here's i i i yeah i i think though part of it and i you know i i'm a super progressive guy uh and so you know i'm sure that's part of it where i what i'm going to say but part, you know when you are from a place where if you do get sick you don't have to worry about becoming homeless because you can't afford your medical bills or if you right. do have a mom who's single and she's struggling you don't have to worry about being kicked out of your neighborhood and you can still get an education or whatever in America, because we don't really have that quality of a safety net, I think there is a lot more um, reaching and necessity or a sense of necessity to reach for that brass ring of, of what fame seems to be able to offer. And so yeah. it takes on more of an importance. But if you're like, look, I don't need that. I'm going to be fine either way. I just want to do what I enjoy. That seems mm -hmm. to be a much healthier perspective that you guys are able to cultivate uh, up there. But that yeah, may not be I, accurate, but it feels accurate. Yeah. And I don't know the circumstances that, you know, Adam has gone through. I, you know, one of the things with EP and re I guess reviews on the run, we kind of heightened up the personalities, uh, you know, as we went into Judgment Day and reviews on the run as as separate things. It was a, a lot more focus on on uh, first Tommy and I and then and then Scott and I and other co-hosts that we had. Right. Um, but, you know, EP really wasn't about the star power of the show the the star right. of ep was that we were visiting all these cool studios and talking to people that nobody knew who they were but they were building the coolest things in the world and we were getting a look inside of all that world and i think with g4 again an american production company an american kind of way of thinking it was no we have to make stars out of all of our personalities we've got to put them out there and that's a lot of pressure on people and it can it can be negative it can be a brutal thing you know and i yeah. i think people chase that and then it bites them in the ass and, and you also own the show i mean that maybe also yeah. was the difference right i mean ep yeah. was always and remains yours whereas g4 adam was work for hire and he was dealing with these kind of upper management yeah. kind of jerks so yeah and, I can and I, you know we were all young at that point too and if you're not you don't know, have you're not facilitated with all the tools to deal with it uh it can it can certainly prey on you but i i wasn't right. chasing fame i wasn't right. ever chasing it so it became this interesting byproduct when people did recognize me and i i you know i've always found it awesome and 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 lovely, you know, my interactions with people and, and what I really saw, w w which happened when we went daily in 2008 with electric playground is suddenly we were an entertainment show that was partnered against TMZ and entertainment tonight and all these things. And entertainment tonight was my inspiration. You and I right. can remember when mm -hmm. ET was a point. Mary Hart. 
yep. used to be incredible. They used to take us behind the scenes on the things that we cared about. Like well, it visit. pissed me off the, now, but I used to love it. Now I look at I know. it and go, it was all PR. I know. God I know. damn it. And, I believe that, that shit. Me too. They would take us to the set of Indiana Jones and Star Wars. I, you and, know, and, and that I, I got to tell you, Victor, it did a lot of damage to me. I don't mean like I'm broken, but it took me yeah. a long time to recover. I know it sounds crazy because most people are like, oh, you were an alcoholic. You were a drug user. Yeah. I binged on the entertainment industry. That's what I wanted yeah. to be in. That's what I wanted yeah. to do. And even stuff like behind the scenes of Indiana Jones, it, 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 and I see it to this day and I'm always pointing out to my kids. It's like, do you notice that what you're seeing is when Spielberg has the good idea or when in these days, uh, uh, Taylor Swift or Neil Druckmann has the aha moment or Kojima. I don't know if you've seen the recent Kojima documentary. I like, I like Kojima a lot, but I thought the documentary was rubbish because it was just like, he would literally sit there in front of a, a TV screen and go, Oh, I think this needs to be a little more translucent. And all the people are, Oh, Oh, what a, you know, it's like, shut the fuck up. You know, it's, it's, it's such horseshit. That's my tangent of the day, Victor, but I will tell you it's, (laughs) it's true though. I mean, entertainment tonight was, was really what sold a lot of my generation and our generation on, Oh, this is what it must mean like to be living a creative life. And when you actually go into it, it's nothing like that. It's really hard. Aspirational moments like that. And, and sure. you can collect them. Like I did a lot of behind the scenes documentaries as part of the work that we've done. Yeah. And there was stuff that we would set up to, you know, kind of illustrate what was happening in a meeting or whatever to kind of get right. that footage. But you know that those meetings took place. And we also did shoot some of those meetings as well. And we did capture some some real moments. And, uh, uh, it, you know, it was it was really cool. It's it is a lot of grinding and a lot of grunt work to have those epiphanous moments in the building of this stuff. And they do happen. They are, they there do. are those awe, do but you they're feel not as glamorous as it's a really interesting thing. Them. Cause you were talking about your editing and just how it's just a time suck. And it's, you know, yeah. if somebody were to make a documentary about your week or your month or life or whatever. Yeah. And, and they didn't show that like, you know, you'll have the artists talking about, oh, it's grueling. It's hard work, but that's just lip service. Cause what they show is like you said, the epiphanous moment, but right. do you feel that it's their responsibility to really make it clear? Or do you think that's not the job of these people? They're there because a lot of people don't want to know how the sausage is made. They want to know yeah. that they think they know how the sausage is made, but there's sure, a real difference sure. between watching entertainment tonight and reading variety. And there's a real difference between reading variety and actually working in a movie studio. So do you think part of it is, you know, I've always been very brutal about the honesty and I've Mm. always thought it would be appreciated, but a lot of people I've, as I've gotten older, I've started to learn. I don't think a lot of people really want that honesty and and I'm not, it's not a judgment. I think they like the fantasy of, uh, the behind the scenes. That's not really the behind the scenes. I mean, do you ever think about that when you're putting all this together and when you were putting it together? Those are, those are different projects, you know, because if you're going to do the project on the difficulty, that's a different story. And that is a, a, you live in the trenches with people. Jeff Keeley did some of Mm -hmm. those 48 hours before they shipped half life stories. And I respect that immensely. And the, and the, partnerships that we've had with the publishers to work on the the docs we haven't had that amount of time with these companies we've had days Mm -hmm. um and maybe a few visits or something like that but i think that there is truth in the building of the the message of where this ship is going you know and you do capture what you can capture and then you get a lot of anecdotal interviews and people presenting you know the journey in bites and sound bites and the road is bumpy and ugly, but that journey is beautiful. And it, it takes you on all kinds of weird twists and turns. And I think there's validity in celebrating that. And uh, it can be through a marketing um, initiative, but hopefully there's some editorial uh, you know, truth to it. And hopefully there's an effort to try to um, paint that this isn't all just, you know, uh, er, you know, a kumbaya thing every single day. There is going to be some some friction and some challenges. I thought that the, uh, 
The Last of Us Part Two doc that just went up on um, YouTube was pretty good for that. I think they did a pretty decent job. But at mm-hmm. the same time, you don't, you know, if you're, I, I think that because we live in this world now where not only do we have this rampant negativity around stuff and and the, the this kind of hostility around creativity and everybody critiquing and everybody working hard to point out what somebody did wrong or the deficiencies in individuals and creative projects. But we also live in a world where journalists are doing great work trying to break down the uh, integrity of the people that are making decisions and and the the, the work-life balance at different institutions and the unionization efforts that are ongoing and happening across the business. And so there's a lot of work out there being done, a lot of critique being done out there about how hard it is and how tough it is and why you shouldn't do it and and you know why making games is just a terrible career not to mention all the layoffs and all that stuff and i don't i that frightens me a bit because it's like what do we want do we want to just encourage upcoming generations to just become twitch streamers and youtubers and just everybody just becomes a you know an online personality of some kind or do we want to try to encourage people to take that leap and to try to collaborate with other people and to learn how to coexist and to learn how to stumble to greatness together uh and i think there's real beauty in that and i feel like we have let t- taken our foot off the gas as a, a media industry and as a video game industry I can only speak about the video game industry sure. sort of allowing us into that creative pipeline and into that world of, of, uh, of, you know, cause Naughty Dog's a perfect example, like the crunch culture and the decision to kind of move to that. And, and, uh, you know, the, I don't know what's true about the, the rumors around Neil and all the other, I don't know, you know, I, I, I don't know, but there's just been a lot of negative shit thrown all over the place around that. And in the midst of all of that, they make a, a game, whether you like it or not, you can kind of respect how bloody creative the last of us mm-hmm. part two. Oh, I, I love the last of us part two. I'm with you on that. Um, you know? I think maybe it just becomes hard when you're faced with this avalanche of evidence to the contrary that, yeah, maybe life is pretty good if you're Neil Druckmann, but if you're one of these people that, you know, are, I don't know. I wouldn't encourage my kids to go into the triple a video game business. I think it's, it, it's, it sounds like a nightmare, but I would encourage them if they wanted to get into the art and medium of interactivity. Yeah. Absolutely. But, but don't do it by, you know, Isn't unless you're a sad, sad state to be in though, to not sure, but that's people every, to play, yeah. play at the highest level to have it's all not the, the highest. Well, that's, that's the disrespectful part to the medium. It's not the highest level. Yeah. The highest level is the people who are at any budget taking the art form in directions that are, uh, clever and interesting and, and really speak to the nature of interactivity to assume right. the highest level is spending the most money on production value, which is what a lot of people decide is the highest level of, of the art mm. form, I think right. in and of itself is a good reason we're in the trouble that we're in, where it's a good reason the movies are in the trouble that they're in. Um, mm. Because the essence of movies is storytelling. The essence of games is interactivity. But both of those things, I think, have gotten uh, kind of buried by flash and polish and production value and i think there's a lot of en- evidence to the contrary on that specific point you know and so? i know that well i know the superhero movies get thrown under the bus and we, we i have love way them. too many of them yeah uh, but there have been some real like guardians of the galaxy 3 last year was a terrific film you know whether sure, you've seen I like any the of the other movies yeah uh, but what i I really admire around AAA games and big budget movies. I, I, let's take Barbie and Oppenheimer last year, mm-hmm. two of the biggest hits. In the hands of artisans not as capable of Greta Gerwig and and uh, Christopher Nolan. Nolan, those movies would not have worked like that. And in fact, I would argue that both of them would have been impossible to make unless you had the talent and the uh, uh, you know, artistic connections and the respect that these artists brought to these particular films, making them both worthwhile, you, you know, portraits of commerce, but also incredibly artful uh, stories to present right. to billi- millions of people around the world to make a billion dollars each. 
And I think those are both unbelievably cool stories. Another one is Godzilla Minus One, which is probably arguably the best film of 2023 that no one will, you know, admit to because <laughs> it's it just seems it's Godzilla. but again it's impossible based on a licensed property and just taking it in and saying what if we made a black and white version of this and Godzilla is Jaws during World War II and it just all of it seems insane but it or actually there is a color version and a black and white version but it's just a beautiful beautiful movie you know John I guess maybe before. the difference though and maybe you know uh is that you don't get to Barbie without Francis Ha. You don't get to Oppenheimer without Memento, right? And so you've got right. these creatives that um, became who they were because they were working in an industry that at the time celebrated and allowed a level of uh, independence and creativity and outside the box thinking. Sure. Um, I think if you're saying you want to be the next Neil Druckmann, like let's say Druckmann is today's Nolan video games. If you want to be that guy, you can't become that guy by going to work at Naughty Dog. I mean, maybe practically you can in some weird, you know, if all the chips fall in the right way or the cards fall the right way for you. But ultimately you've got to go off and make things, uh, get attention somewhere else and then find your way. I, into I, I, I think so. And I, I mean, let me ask yeah, you, this. I, you, I, you have a kid. I don't know how old she is. It's none of my business. I want to get into that, but yeah. eventually she will say, I want to go to work. Hopefully. Yeah. Um, yeah. And if she said, dad, I want to go work in the AAA space and make video games as a creative, you know, I have, mm -hmm. I have ideas, I have visions. I want to contribute. Would you steer her towards AAA or would you say, you know, why don't you do some indie stuff? Um, and really that's where you're going to be able to shine. If you have the capacity to shine at all. The thing I like about AAA is that it forces you. This is what I think is the most important part of collaboration. And yep. it's not something I've always known, but I think the most important part of collaboration is finding a way to respectfully and with empathy communicate with people in an honest way and finding a way to illustrate your ideas and your thoughts and your, your hopefulness for where this is going. Um, with other people and share those common thoughts and find a way to those common thoughts. And AAA at its best really helps to reinforce that. And I think that the lessons that you can learn in AAA will um, guide an individual in a lot of really powerful and wonderful directions. And there's a commercial element in there and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, which Sony I think is learning the hard way right now. I think they're really, figuring out that they've they've spent a lot um and have released these mega hits but only to the audience that has their machine and you know a whole bunch of things that we can get into business wise there but i i think that there's a lot of incredible lessons that anybody that wants to make video games will learn from AAA. i also sure. do think that the people that would excel in a situation like that will find a path to do that i and think that's I, true yeah that's good point. yeah and, and i also think that triple a can learn from indie and there's a lot of cross respect i also think that there's some beautiful things like ubisoft toronto is a great example where they'll have indie nights and indie jams and they'll invite the community into their you know high-tech state-of-the-art space and try to build a community there i think that's a really powerful part of the video game industry and that exists in every city and i think that there is this kind of uh, I mean, you know better than I, if you're in the trenches, you know how difficult it is at every bloody state. And I think what we're going through right now is a reckoning and a real understanding of the terror and the challenge of, of games that has always existed, but we're finding more tools and more outlets and more ways to express that. And, and we're finding more paths to whatever comes next, you know, and we're also seeing the fallacy of belief that only one trajectory is the way for games to go like live service ain't it man it's not the right. only way for the industry to survive if you, you cannot have a top 50 of live service games you know right. like there's just do you think not Warner, what, what, do you, the clock. what do you think's happening you think this is what's the guy's name zazlav or whatever the guy who runs yeah. warner brothers now i mean everything yeah. from that to killing the the coyote movie to, i mean do you think this guy's long for that role or no i think they're trying to bundle it up and and jettison it and make a really nice big parachute i think that's oh they want to they want to sell the whole thing 
Yeah, I think they're well, trying to. They're. I mean, here's what I know about executives at that level. They they are playing sim corporate you know they're playing yeah. their video game is how do we move thousands of people around and just manufacture products that s juice the price of our value and then i can pivot and ride a ladder in a different direction with x amount of growth on my portfolio and my value as a person until i reach this point everybody in that field unless you're the owner unless you're bezos or musk knows they have a, a shelf life and right. they have to raise as much money as they possibly can while they the going is good and then they get out you know and they know that companies live and die and they buy it's a you know like look at all the companies that ea has purchased and and closed down and sold but your off theory and, is and i think you're probably right and if i was yeah, younger I and, and if i yeah. was hungry again like for video games and sort of quote relevancy in the creative space which i don't care about anymore um, I think you're right. The right people, even in that scenario, you've just described working at a company like that, that's run by people like that, you still find the tunnels and avenues that you can sneak through to get your vision financed and executed with their, with their ducats. I mean, I do think yeah. that's a really good point. There is a, yeah. a skill to working, in the system of shit that it has possibly probably always been. Um, I mean, you've probably had to experience that with television. I mean, to get your show funded, to get it on the air, to deal with all the, I can't imagine there weren't demands and acquiescences to advertisers. I mean, there must be a whole list of stories that, that, you know, aren't really for prime time that you had to deal with to get EP running for as long as it did. Correct. It's never been easy. You know, it's yeah. always been a, a challenge to work with corporations and to put deals together. At the very beginning, I had uh, advertisers because we've always had sponsors, Nintendo and PlayStation and Xbox and Sega and EA and Activision. Like we right. started out of Canada and the Canadian economy in media has never been great. And our budgets have never been huge, but we've required assistance to be able to hire people and put all of this together. That's that's the difference, you know, from a YouTube video and a group of people building a broadcast quality television show is that there's a real expenditure and it's an ongoing right. kind of, you know, you have to pay the bills and you have to ship the shows. And so I've had, you know, a lot of. Uh, interesting conversations with advertisers got asked right out of the gate. Like, why am I going to sponsor you if that company is sponsoring you and that company is sponsoring it? It's like, well, look, this isn't, let's just say it's PlayStation. This isn't the electric PlayStation. Okay. This is the electric playground and we're all playing in it. And that's what people want to see. They want to see everybody's work. They want to see all these different people. We want to represent the entire industry. This is about the, the value of, what everybody is working on and it's all going to rise. It's all going to benefit from it and nobody's right. doing it. And that's what I kept pointing at. Who's doing this? Anybody? No one, no one is doing this. Here's our shot. Let's do it. And, uh, you know, I'm boiling it down, but it, it, there was a lot of conversations where it was a lot of investment in trying to explain this and, 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 um, uh, reinforce that there was value here. Um, but then once the, the pieces started to come together, what I quickly realized is that I had a lot of trust from the partners that we had, whether they were broadcast right. partners or advertisers. And I think what we did is we really, we threaded a weird, difficult needle of like making advertisers happy, making the broadcasters happy and making the viewers, most importantly, happy with the kinds of material that we were putting together, which they had not seen before. And I was right. only interested right. in making that, only that. I did not want to remake other studio based video game shows. You know, I really wanted the, the community of, uh, the game makers to be respected and represented in our material. They were the stars of the show, you know, and it took a few, you know, seasons of making the content before I really kind of to recognize my value in all of this. You know, I was, a uh, an avatar for the viewer. I was a conduit to that. I knew what I, the work I was doing, like getting to these companies and these people was adding interest to the material. But me as an individual in the mix of it all, we actually had a, a focus test on, on um, 
a season when we were with Discovery Science and, mm. and it came back that the viewers really liked me on screen. And I had never thought of it like that. And it was such a juice. It was such a an empowering thing. It's like, oh, I, ha I, I have value here, you know? Were you a nightmare and, after that information? Did it take a while for you no, to come down? No, no, no. I just, I, I, you know, and Tommy was always, to his credit, was always telling me that, you know, and he really loved to play with me, you know, and, and, uh, was that the best? Me. Was that the best pairing? I mean, I know you've had a no. lot of co-hosts, but you no. don't think that my, was the my best? favorite co-host is uh, to review stuff with is Scott, and my Why? favorite, uh, I, he's brilliant. He's just a brilliant okay. Scott Jones. I'm talking about. Yeah. He's just an incredibly intelligent person. He's a beautiful writer um, who knows how to inject his humanity into the work that he does, and he knows how to have a perspective on things and articulate things in a way that challenged me. You know, I, I always thought it was funny when Tommy would make fun of my vocabulary <laughs> because I, I, you know, I, whatever he would make fun of it. And I thought it was funny and the audience would think it was funny. And I thought that was cool. But with Scott, I really felt like I had to up my game as a communicator and he would challenge me in a different way. And I really appreciated that. I loved working with Marissa as well because she was just a, you know, uh, she was really into it and she was very funny and really open to you know collaboration uh and everybody that i i hired uh along the way had so much value in what they were already doing in the world like ben silverman was right writing right, for right different people he's an incredibly intelligent human being super funny it honestly was down to ben or scott about who we were going to invite to you know come and, and relocate to vancouver um, and, and Scott had less things connecting him to New York. So he made the, the, the move to Canada, which was right. amazing. And he still lives in Vancouver and we still see each other all the time. And uh, I love that guy. Uh, but Marissa was wonderful and Steve Tilly and Raju Mudar were wonderful to work with. And, and I was nervous, man, when we shifted and we were shifting from daily and building the show in a bunch of different directions because we'd done so many seasons of the, 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 the host ingredients that we'd had before. Right. And suddenly right. it was in a very similar thing to what happened when, uh, uh, Gene Siskel passed away and Roger Ebert oh, had to. Right. Yeah, he had to get, but he guest hosted with a whole bunch of different people. He did, he, didn't he? He had like yeah. Kevin Smith even and Tarantino showed up once. Yeah. And yeah, but and he ended so up with I, Roper, was, right? It was Roper and yes, then Siskel. Uh, who died first? No, Siskel goes first. Then it was yes. Ebert and Roper. Yes. And then, okay, yeah. right, right, right. Yeah. And I, I, you know, they were my, my North star, Siskel and Ebert, yeah. right? That for, in terms of reviews and, and that sort of chemistry and that honesty that would happen after they had read all the, scripted yeah. bits about what their movies were when they were fighting back and forth yeah. it's like that's fun man that's what i want to yeah. put into the video game reviews and but I, I it was interesting then to see them deal with it and then i had to deal with that same kind of thing a little bit later on with figuring out who was going to host but that gave me a shot to have a lot of friends on jeff started to, he was hosting already on ep but he started to do some reviews with me mark saltzman a uh, bunch of different voices from across right. the industry. And uh, and then we went daily with EP and then we went daily with reviews on the run. And I was able to hire this team mostly comprised of just great writers, just great communicators that had already had their chops kind of sewn on how they express themselves in this industry. And, and uh, to watch them flower on screen and become really good presenters and communicators was incredibly gratifying and it, it you know a whole new level of pride that i had never anticipated you know it, right it, it's been a crazy dream all of well this. i want to talk about that i want to talk about ep coming now so i didn't i didn't know what pnp was it took me a little bit because i'm like yeah. you guys are going back now and running all of the television uh episodes yes. starting on the 23rd of march from the very first one mm -hmm. all the way up till when it went off TV, I imagine. I mean, that's like how many seasons? Seven or eight, I think you said, or twenty-five nope. seasons of the Electric Playground. And yeah, yeah, 14 yeah but seasons. Oh, and fourteen seasons of uh, reviews on the run. And so the plan is, and we started as a weekly show, so we're right. going to start this as a weekly show. And so P and P Games came on as a sponsor. And what happened is. But they're, uh, they're, last, they sell game. That's what I was confused about. They're like GameStop. I mean, because when I go to their website, it's like a store, yeah. right? 
Well, they, they sell, and I was very purposeful on this. I wanted to partner with a company that sold retro content and retro okay. games because of the connection to our regular material. You know, the material and the content was going to be about PlayStation 2 and and Dreamcast. Oh, and, and, right, uh, right, right, right. That launch makes great of all sense. Of these We're talking to you and other people building these games back then. And it's like, okay, well, let's celebrate them. And then that fit is a really interesting and perfect one. But all of this started with... I, I had two paths with this project and I haven't wanted to make this my full-time thing. Um, cause I still like talking about all the new things and I love right. interviewing new creators and reviewing new stuff. I got a couple of codes that I've been waiting for and excited to play today. Um, so what I are they Victor? You can't drop that and not tell me what the codes are. Don't tell I me can't. what I think I'm under embargoes like crazy. You don't I tell me if the anything. game's good. You can't just tell me what your codes for um, a couple of big March releases. <laughs> all right fine keep going big, pvp big ones P &P, um, sorry. I, <laughs> and so um i had a couple of paths like i was you know sending this sporadic email out to different people that you, we both probably know in the in the games industry about you know what i've got this archive i want to get it out there and you know is there an interest in maybe sponsoring it and i can hire a couple of people to kind of digitize everything and piece this all together and we can start to do that and I got some interest, but it was taking its time. And then in the midst of that, um, the University of Toronto Mississauga purchased a physical media collect a video games uh, from a gentleman that passed away. His name is Sid Bolton. And he had the largest collection of games and PCs and hardware in this space in Canada out of Brantford, Ontario. And Going Scott, back actually, how far? Like Atari well, era? To the very or? beginning. Beginning. Wow. Like okay, cool. copies of extraterrestrials, you know, not ET, but extraterrestrials for the Atari 2600, uh, everything. And That's he's awesome. just a huge fan of EP, wonderful guy. I got to know him because he lived in the Toronto area and we'd, we'd connect when, whenever we'd get out there. Scott Jones actually lived in Toronto and would see him quite regularly. And when he passed away, he stepped up and helped his widow, Jenny. Hi, Jenny, if you're watching. Uh, try to find a home for this collection. And so he was talking with a bunch of different people and I, you know, I chipped in with some ideas here and there, but he was like boots on the ground trying every day to find the great fit. And then the University of Toronto, Mississauga was building up a game studies division within the school. It's a great school, by the way. I was out there to kind of celebrate our partnership. And, and just so just, I want to be clear on that real quick, game studies division, that's not game creation. That's like critical studies of the art form. Yes. Yeah, yes. that's what's needed, man. That's so yep. awesome. That's fucking yep. awesome. Okay, keep going. Well, Sorry. So they got they got the Sid Bolton collection, and then Scott introduced me to Chris Young, who is the the head of the libraries out there. And then we got it to talking, and I thought, you know, uh, maybe there's a fit for our content there to kind of partner with all this physical video game stuff. And so we put an educational license to deal together and Chris came out to me and we were working out of my garage because I had all the physical media stored in my garage and we just was it stored it on up. just like big beta tapes or what, 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 what everything what you... beta cam SP, uh, mini DV, DVC pro XD cam okay. and wow. on hard drives. Okay. And it was a massive 4,000 episodes of television. And then all Goodness. of the a roll, all of the, the, you know, the 20 minute interviews that we would yeah. shoot that we would, right. Oh, you got that minutes. as well. Okay. Yes. And also some of the footage, uh, you know, some recorded stuff that we would do and also B-roll from companies and all kinds of just gems, you know. And so now all of that went to the university. They have started to digitize all that as part of our arrangement. They're going to send me all the media because they don't own the media. I own it all, but right. they've got the license to show it to their students. And um, so they're going to share it with their students That's there, amazing. which I think yeah. is invaluable for them. You know, because in off, honestly, we were the only outfit that was visiting a lot of these companies. Yeah, I mean, I saw your I saw your trailer on your channel for this, and it, it's like you know, as a guy who lived it, and yeah. that was really my heyday back then. It's like a time machine. I mean, all yes. the Miyamoto looks like he's like twenty five years old, and yep. you know, I think uh, uh, who is the guy? Uh, uh, Molino had hair. I was like, who yep. the fuck? That's fucking Peter Molino. Yeah, it's really yeah. cool. And you're yeah. right. I don't know who else has this content. It, the it, the the mat the scope. So I love that. I love that it's protected now. So maybe in a hundred years, people are studying video games, and it's like, hey, who's that handsome fuck? Oh, <laughs> that Victor Lucas behind him. That's Jaffe, though. If you're curious, <laughs> but uh, that's awesome. 
Awesome. Well, I'm yeah, I'm very, I mean, very appreciative and very excited that this is happening and honored as well. And and I got to go out to the school and meet some of the faculty and some of the people that are working on all that at the library. And so when that sort of piece was being taken care of, because that was a huge chunk of the work is just digitizing it. And then, uh, you, know, you know, we want to database it. So all of it is very easily searchable as well, because it's one thing to have all that content. It's right. another thing to like find things. The other, the other thing that's been happening with me, David, because we did all of this field work and all of these visiting with companies, is, you know, we're losing people, you know, and when yeah, Bernie Stoller passed away, uh, who was the president of mm -hmm. Sega? I had people, and then came to, to then came to PlayStation, which was he was at PlayStation. Yes, yeah, yeah. very colorful, super cool yep. guy. We had him on the show a bunch of times, but people were asking me for clips and footage and pictures, and I I don't have it all, and I didn't have it all on YouTube because of the effort to get it all there. But I had something, right. and I was able to find it, and I it really hit me like this is my work, and this was our our effort to, you know, document everything, but there's a responsibility here. Like we really have the, the history of games, a, yep. a big chunk of it is sitting right there. And so we need to do something with it. And so the school AI is going to be your best friend soon. It's going to just be <laughs> well, like, show me the Bernie Stoller stuff where it's funny. I guess so, right? Yeah. There's yeah, six clips. So. Yeah, I guess so. Well, anyways, yep. they're digitizing it. They're sending me the material. And then I thought, okay, well, now that I've got the content, here is an opportunity to help me with, you know, getting it out there and putting it out there and finding new ways and, and sharing it. And also an opportunity to market whatever they're working on. But let's make it a fit and let's make it something where the, the people that are participating in this see the value in it and are excited to do it. And so I put out a uh, you know, an, an innocuous tweet just saying, are there any retro game stores out there that would like to talk about a, an electric playground project that I'm working on? And a couple of people uh, tweeted at PMP and they got back to me like the next day and we set up a, a phone call in November last year. And PMP, is great. PMP Canadian or they're, yeah. cause I, I didn't, I'd never heard of them until I went to their site and I'm like, Oh, this is pretty cool. There's a lot of good stuff they're there. Um, they sell everything and they're like the Canadian retailer and partner for a lot like retro bid and limited run and all that stuff. So yeah. They give so you'll be able of, to go to their site and click. Yep. So it's not on your channel. It's on. No, it's going to be on EP. It's going to be on our YouTube channel. Okay. I, 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 I could only, this project is a big one, but I could only kind of put the package together around what I can, what I know. You know, I okay. don't know where this is going to go, but what I do know is we have our channel at youtube.com slash EPTV right. and people do come there. I want more people to come there and to subscribe to it and they'll yes. watch the content there. I don't know where this goes, but the other thing that I'm definitely asking people is if you're, and they serve Americans and Canadians out of PMP, uh, is just to buy your games there. Cause what they're like, I'm not going out there with the Patreon or a GoFundMe right. or any other thing. I'm going to serve up all this content, but just support this work if you want, if you like it and want to watch these classic episodes and this content. And you're going to be watching there. with the fans, right? So every episode, yeah. or at least the first episode, you're going to watch no, and I'm be in the comments or. Week. Yeah, I'll Every be in the week. comments. Yeah, and then I don't know how much more stuff I'll do. I don't know if I'll I'll do some live streams with it. I mean, I'm certainly my wheels are spinning. Cool. But I also am cognizant, like just this last week, just announcing that, like almost every minute of my day has been, you know, let's talk yeah. about the classic stuff, which is fine because it's coming. Yeah. But I don't want this every week. I don't want it like it's all what right. I did. Because oh, I'm sorry. Has you... your success has your success gotten in the way of your fun time? <laughs> no, uh, no that, you know. But what would be cool is to grow this a little bit, and I've got some other people to help me right. with spreading the word. And then, uh, well, it, it's uh, very cool. It's very exciting. Yeah. I, I have, I don't like EP is weird because I, when I mentioned you were coming on, there was a lot of people kind of like the same thing they said about Sessler, which is, and the same thing some people say about me when they talk about the games I got to work on, which is, oh, this was such a big part of growing up for me, you know? Yeah. And uh, EP for me was this thing that marketing or PR was like, hey, Jaffe, go do this show. But yeah. because I, I think, I don't know when it was on in America, I would watch it when, you know, I would, when I was on I'll it, I'm like, how do I place. see this, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, but for so many people, this was their childhood jam really uh you know Which and that's unbelievable yeah. yeah i mean it's very very cool it's very exciting and i'm looking forward to watching the first episode because i don't 
I mean, who's on the, what is the, what, who you got coming up on the first episode, March 23rd. That's one thing that I'm going to do is every week I'm going to do this week on electric playground. I'm going to do a whole every week. I'm going to put that out there. And yeah, well, the first episode is celebrating E3 as an idea. The first E3? We were at shooting at the very first, we've shot at every wow. single E3. So, so that's this, celebrating the first one or no, just all of them? The first three, because we Got didn't it. air until 1997. But there are, are clips from the very first mm. E3, including Steve Race talking about the mm-hmm. launch of the PlayStation. And he didn't last much longer than 1995, but he's right. in that well, very first episode. He, he, he did either go big or go home. I guess he went home. But yeah, that was yeah. something. That was something to be at E3. I mean, man, it's gone yeah. now, but that was amazing. Those those first 10 years of that show were delightful. Oh, Just fucking amazing, delightful. brother. We were so um, fortunate. And, and I honestly, I and dude, I, I just want to put this out there to kind of reinforce that there's another way, you know? I don't know if this is the only way. I don't I mean, IGN's that. trying something this summer, right? I mean, maybe that'll work. They're doing their summer yeah, fest. No, I'm talking about the-, the, the, the type of coverage that we were doing. You know, the, oh, the type I see, of, I see. You, you know, going to the people and and because there, I... I don't want to dog anybody's efforts or anybody else's choices on what they did with the the coverage of stuff, but there's something very different about going to a studio or even going to a booth and, and you know, they're in front of the shit that they've made and they're excited as hell about it. It's different when you have them come to your studio and they sit down with you and there's validity in both ways, but there's something very honest about going to the home of where this creativity is is being right. done and pulling that interview together and and trying to make that as fun and entertaining as possible and honestly when i thought about it it's like it's going to be a lot of effort and a lot of time on the part of the, the university university of toronto mississauga for them to take all of that content it's going to be years of effort for them mm-hmm. and i thought there aren't going to be a lot of things that they're uh, a school like that would want to do you know, but because we did the work of going out to meet all of these different people, they see real value in that. And I think there is, you know, and I think that that's missing. And I think because it's missing, I think that there is a lack of awareness that there are human beings on the end of these creative decisions. They're people, you know, and we going back to the first couple of questions, then do you feel that legacy because i know it was entertaining and i know it was celebratory but do you feel future students who are looking at what it meant to make video games do you think they are getting a fair and balanced look or do you think it's a little more saccharine and glamorized in a way that maybe isn't as much truth if you would have known now then what you know now where this is going to end up i think it's aspirational and raw And, you know, in those early in those early episodes, we would go to studios and we would see sleeping bags under desks and we would joke about it. And you'd film and, it and talk about it because okay. that, that was the that was the culture then, you know, <laughs> Still that would not now, be the culture much. now. It's, well, yeah, it depends. It, well, it wouldn't be on 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 air now. Let's put it that way. And there, and there would be a different dissection of it now. Yeah. But the other thing that happened, David, is that I heard from a lot of executives along the way, a lot of game studio um, uh, managers and developers that they decided that they wanted to pursue the work of making video games because they saw our show and they saw that people were making these things and they saw these studios. And yes, we projected a sense of joy and levity and fun, uh, because it was, it, right. it really was. We had a great time when we visited with these people. And more often than not, these people had a great time, you know? And and uh, I don't know if it's the same now, but I think that there was a... I mean, you have to that. be aware there was a sense of performativeness going on when you visited those studios, though. I mean, yeah, yeah they had a great time. Huh? Yeah, also on our part, too. I would remember going to... Um, studios and there would be nothing up on the walls. It would just be white walls and just really <laughs> like flat. Get some fucking art up there or something, man. Yeah. And then we'd go to some and they had cool shit. And it's like, God, guys, just make a set for us, you know, make it right. look a little aspirational here as well, you know, because yeah. honestly, I, there is a performative element of it. But here's my thinking on all of it. If we paint the picture collectively, that this industry makes beautiful things and it's super fun to work in, guess what we're going to engender? 
guess what we're going to inspire? We're going to inspire bitterness people. when people discover the truth. Well, yeah, an element of that for sure. But you know, there are going to be some sweetheart studios, and there, there are, are going to be some. There are, and You'll there get are some going to be some valves out of it. You know, yeah. that's true. We'll, that's a good yeah. point. And we'll get some people taking that leap and making great things that we hadn't even thought of before. Yeah. I no, I mean, there, that's cool shit, man. I'll tell you what, Victor, I'm serious. I wish I had been raised in Canada. You guys are so much happier. We're a bunch of fucking <laughs> grumps down here, but you know, well, uh, cynicism okay, I, is, is needed in this world right now, for sure. Unfortunately, but I, I, I have I two fast industry now. questions, real yeah. fast ones. And then I want to get to the audience paid questions, if that's okay with you. Sure, of course, yeah. Okay. Industry question number one, uh, Sony, what's your prediction? I mean, they I I I still have friends over there. I uh like you said, the fact that they greenlit and made a hit out of a, a most expensive art house video game is amazing. Yeah. The fact they did it again with Death Stranding, even though it wasn't as big of a hit, is still the most yeah. expensive art video game I've ever heard of. Uh yeah. there there's a, a ballsiness to some of the people that remain there, people like Rody and Shu and, and uh, Druckmann and Corey and all that stuff. But they're also up against the wall with their business model. What do you think is going to happen with, with that them as a publisher? Um, I mean, I, I think it would matter. I, I think this idea of locking your exclusives is, is a, a, a difficult thing for any company. And Microsoft is certainly playing with that. I think that decision would be more meaningful if more people were invested in Xbox, if Xbox was taking up and eating up mm. more market share. The thing that I always think about is how absurd it is that Spider-Man is arguably one of the most, you know, beloved characters in all of popular culture on earth right now, everywhere. Yeah. And it's locked to a platform and now a couple with PC, which is good. But if if I it, it, it is akin to the movie studio saying we're only going to release this in a certain type of theater or we're only going to release this on, you know, a proprietary Blu-ray disc that will work on Sony Blu-ray players. And I think it's kind of crazy to lock all of that shareholder value and win around this exceptional series on a specific system. And I know that the history of games has been to buy these specific systems, but as we're seeing, it's harder to invest and pay for these exclusives that, that create that impetus at the same time as all of these different hardware architectures are virtually identical. There aren't lot, that many yeah. things that are, that are that different between the PlayStation and the Xbox and presumably whatever the next generation of Switch is going to be is probably going to be very analogous to maybe last generation of whatever Xbox and, and PlayStation. So when I think about that as a, if I'm a shareholder, I'm thinking, why wouldn't you want to put that specific game on more machines? And once yeah. you start to think about that, it's like, well, that's really the door that's been holding back well, because kind of, industry. kind of though, because think about, I mean, think about how ludicrous it is that yeah. you in, in the past, you're like, well, yeah, we're doing those exclusives. So people buy our hardware because the lion's share of this stuff comes from the third party licensing fee. So yes. even, you know, all these games that are multi-platform, if you sell one on a Sony machine, they get X percent uh, of yeah. everything, even if they had nothing to do with making that game. Think about how mm -hmm. ludicrous it is now that the budgets of these games are getting so high that clearly that is no longer meaningful enough to offset. Uh, yeah. uh, I think the, we're saying the, the same thing. It's crazy. Yeah. Now I it's crazy. The same I understand thing. it back I, in the day, but now it it's is nuts. crazy and yeah. and the business needs it. And I think that there will be an appetite for AI to kind of soften the expense of some of these studios and the, and the studios are definitely going to have a lot of, uh, right. uh, you know, anecdotal evidence to support the adoption of technologies that will bring down the costs of things. I think that that expectation of production quality is not going to disappear. You know, I think there's going to be this desire of these top tier AAA companies to continue to reach these high watermarks. But I also think it's kind of, uh, um, it, it really affects the business that we keep selling to the same amount of people every generation. You know, it's yeah. not growing exponentially like the budgets. Well, I, on the I know I have theories, but what's your theory as to why that we can't, you know, the, the Sean Layden pie of 300 million 
Yeah. It gets split up differently, but it doesn't really grow or shrink all that much when it comes to console. Well, I think games. it's because you're asking the co the consumer and this is the stuff that we, you know, we're trying to, the consumer has, you have to ask the consumer to be incredibly educated. It's such a tough thing. In the language of interactivity or what do you mean? Yeah. In the, in the language of video games, you, you, you have to, you, you view on that person, that, that purchasing consumer. And oftentimes it's a mom in a, in a household to walk into a store or peruse an online store and know exactly what choice to make at every step of the way to get somebody to have fun with a video game. And that seems so like so many obstacles, so many hurdles, so many choices of what clubhouse to, to join. And, mm. oh, I effed up, you know, I was an Xbox person, so I stayed with Xbox, but I'm not happy with Xbox this generation. I should have gone with PlayStation. You're creating all of these different obstructions from people to have the fun of video games. And you're at really asking that initial consumer to know so much about why they're buying this and who they're buying it for. And ha also not to mention the amount of trust that you're asking of them, that this thing that you're spending your initial money on will be a, a supported with lots and lots of fun things to play. And I feel like a lot of that stuff should siphon away and make the friction be as light as possible and let people just play as many of these experiences as possible. It sucks for an Xbox player that loves Spider-Man that they can't play Spider-Man on that machine. It yeah. sucks for them, you know, and it sucks for the, the, the mom of that kid, you know, if they bought the wrong thing and right. how it, it, that's stupid. I, I mean, it just I, I is. I think what sucks even more is the fact that there's nothing in there for the mom. Um, I think yes, if you're talking too. about yes. growing the yeah. pie, and I think Agreed. it's wonderful that parents and older people have been able to embrace interactivity via simpler games. But I do wonder, and I don't know where like Amy's uh, Captain America Black Panther thing is going to end up. I know there was a time she was talking about, and I was very excited to see this. She did a, a conversation with Tim Schafer at Dice, and yeah. she was talking about uh, trying, not games. making Bandersnatch, but yeah. making something that was more anybody could sit around the TV and play it. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if it's become more of a straight up triple A action game, but I think that's a big problem, which is, you know, uh, a lot of these games that cost a lot of money are, you know, anybody can go watch a Marvel movie. And if it's a good Marvel movie, they're in, even if they don't have a history of loving comic books, but not anybody can pick up Spider-Man. Even if Spider-Man was on every console in the world, uh, very, you know, the number of people that could pick it up and like understand the controller and all that. I think that yeah. is that pie is never going to grow until that gets fixed. I mean, I, I well, think I think out of all of the the you know the big triple A experiences that have come out, you know, in this era, that's sure. probably the 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 lowest barrier to entry. I think if you handed a controller to anybody and just got them swinging around in New York City as Spider-Man, they're going to have a smile on their face. I think oh, yeah, but you got to have them not run away screaming when they see the controller. And I think it's just intimidating that, to a lot of people. Another obstacle for sure. Right. But, you know, you could just let them play Mary you... Jane. She's the most powerful character in the whole game. So <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I, I like true. That I was a fan. I, 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 I freaking that's why Spider-Man 2 is my favorite. And honestly, I love what PlayStation PlayStation is just an, a a an incredible company, you know, yeah. for well, the they were, I don't made. know who they are anymore. I don't no, know man, what's going to emerge, but I, I like, the, you know, the, the horizon series and, and Spider-Man and, Ugh. you know, I, and Spider-Man stuff and uncharted. I, there like, are people at, yes, there are people there that are amazing. I, yes, I don't know though. Re I'm, I'm not, I'm not just kind of doing console war stuff. I don't really do that. I just, I don't know who's calling the shots at this point? Like when you look at the guy who's the interim head right now, he seems to have a very different philosophy uh, than the shoes of the world, than the Sean Layden yeah. of the world, possibly even the, uh, the, the Jack, Jack Ryan. Jack. Tretton. What's the guy's name? Jack. Who's Tretton. the guy in clear and present danger that Harrison Ford played? Uh, Jack Ryan. God, it's not the same guy. Is it all this time? I've haven't put it together. <laughs> <laughs> it's the same fucking guy, same name. Anyway, I don't know anymore. No, you're thinking of Jim Ryan and Jack Tretton. Jim Ryan and Jack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm getting old, baby. <laughs> um, but 
yeah, I mean, I don't know who's running the, the, the creative decisions anymore. So I know they have a lot of talent over there. There's no doubt. Yeah. But well, they need, I, 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 the only thing I would say to Sony is that they need to invest in the wackier stuff that they are famous for as well. You know, yeah. I think one of the things that Nintendo shows the business is they, they make an event out of every release that they make, no matter how obscure that title is. Yeah, and they, they celebrate all of it all the way along and they think all of it has value. And I think one of the things that they don't know is maybe this one will hit, you know? Right. They, well, they Helldivers, I don't think anybody expected Helldivers, which did not cost the kind of money totally. that most of their so games. much from Helldivers. Right. I, like, we all want new Jack and Daxter and Sly Cooper and, and uh, Ape Escape. You know, Sony's got all of these beautiful things in their catalog. But the thing that I love about what Sony makes with these AAA cinematic experiences is that these are great conduits to tell people that video games are a lot more they're they're a lot more um ambitious than what your preconceived notions are and every time i've yeah. gone on local news or national news or wherever and they just sort of cursory have discussions around video games then the anchors always come back right with this trite thing of like wow the, the kings have come a long way since pac-man and it's like yeah no shit this is what we do now in the video game okay, but, this but is how, you're how seeing how less of that is. i imagine right because now we're i mean you and i i don't know how old you are i'm 52 i imagine you're yeah. somewhere in your 40s right i'm, I'm um, I, happy 36 year old just uh what the fuck and look how long you no, spend on I, your hair it's got to no, be more than a minute <laughs> no it how takes long? me a while God always damn it to get this thing up and to but spray the point is though i mean there's a point where we are becoming the anchors right in terms of age and i think yeah you know i don't know bro we'll always be playing man well absolutely be but that's what I, that's yeah. what i'm saying so i i, I yeah. i'm very excited to see if you know when when we hit 80 uh yeah. are we i'd like to think i'm still going to be playing i haven't lost interest in games at all as i've gotten older so yeah. um but yeah i mean they've they've come a long way i'm excited for the future but it's I have a bit of a bit more cynical take, but okay. Last question is just, when do you play these fucking games? Because I see your reviews. Yep. I take forever to finish a game. Are you just really fast? Like, how do you get through these fucking things? I'm not, I'm not very fast. And I spend a crazy amount of time and my wife and my daughter, um, put up with it and it sucks. And I think about that all the time. And that's a big part of why I think that games should, there's a number of reasons why I think, and this is another reason why I like the Sony experiences as well. Those aren't typically super long. They right. typically don't waste a lot of your time. And Spider-Man 2 jumped to the top of my list because it did not have me grinding in circles mm. around trying to build up stuff. I felt every second of that game was valuable and I finished it and I wanted more of it. And I want more games to be like that. I want more video games, whether they're role-playing games or whatever, to be done. And all you want to do is stay in that world and play it more. And I felt that about big games like Red Dead Redemption 1, not so much about Red Dead Redemption 2, but I, 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 I think... We have so many things tugging at us in this mm -hmm. world and more stuff is probably going to explode in this AI kind of thing that I want designers and developers to really think about, you know, how do we channel to the fun quicker and not not lean into grinding and running around in circles, leveling up and all right. the things that worked before things are going to have to shift there a little bit. And I mean, really leaning into that. the fun quicker. I'm with you on the grinding is I think a result, unless you're talking about a, a game that really benefits from it, like a, a vampire survivor or an RPG or something um, yeah. is, is a result of the budget. I mean, ratchet and clank rift apart is probably the best, one of the best yeah. games I've ever played. Yeah. And it didn't do that well. Um, yeah. part of it was, it was a launch title or close to launch title, but part of it was, it was really fucking expensive. And, you know, I, I think, I don't know. I don't know what you do when you talk about Sony has all these Jack and Daxters and Sly and all it's like, unless they can make them for a lot less money, which I hope they can, cause they're brilliant. Uh, but you're not going to get them looking as, I mean, I've never seen a game look as good as clank the new one. And yeah. that's yeah. five years old now. It's still one of the most beautiful games ever made. I think. Well, let me answer your question about how do I play them? I just play them. I play them, you know, as, as far as I can get to them when I can, uh, and I finish a lot, but I don't finish every damn thing. I play them for right. as long as I feel like, okay, I know what I feel about this. I can go. So you don't feel you have to finish. People give me shit about that all the time. You don't have to finish, finish a game, game to review I, it. I, I, I finish as much as I can. And if I feel the impetus to finish them, but I can't finish every single game. 
right. and review as often as I would like to review. Do and, you make it clear in your reviews often yeah. the level yes, and do. people are okay yeah. with that? They don't come yep. at you? Yeah, no. And and I, I when I do live streams, I talk about it as well. I mean, I okay. do the best that I can uh, and still make content and connect with people. And I think that there's a lot of value in uh, and the amount of content, uh, the amount of time that you put into something and you come back and you relay that. And, uh, Got it. so yeah, I do, I do. Um, but I do play games a, a lot. I mean, that's what I do. And that's, that right. also factors into uh, all of the choices that I make, you know, for better or for worse, all of the things that I decide to do. It's like, okay, well, if I do this, if I go there, like I'm not going to GDC this year, because right. I have a stack of games mm -hmm. that I want to be fair to, you know, right. and it's really come down to that. You know, I know I'm busy right now with telling people about the, the classic EP stuff, but I have a stack of really, really big games. That Can people... you say what you're playing right now? That's not embargoed. Like, what are you spending time with playing well, right now? You can, you can, uh, I, 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 you can guess, but you know, Dragon's Dogma 2 is coming and Rise of the Ronin is coming. Mm -hmm. And these are games that I've been looking forward to playing. Do you think doing. people got... are correct to be excited for those games based on what you've played? So I, far? I haven't played yet. I haven't played. Oh, gotcha. Yet. Okay. Yeah, got it. I'm okay. still kind of wrapping up my thoughts on what Hell Divers Two means to me, but it's been really right. fun. But now I can see the crescendo of, of that fun. I can see like I'm cresting on, uh, you know, and it's also way more fun in specific to Hell Divers Two if you can gel with a team and, and yeah, that's the reason I don't on. play it that much because the frequency yeah. of that is so rare that it, yeah. you got to have that group yeah. and it's a pain to put that group together all the time but i think it's great yeah. it's a great game yeah. all right well, let's the thing the that's, audience. i think oh, that they can learn from hell divers 2 specific to that is that's a game that looks like it came out of the playstation 3 era and it's beautiful there's beautiful lighting and beautiful elements to it but that certainly looks like a and i know they worked for years on the game and i'm not throwing, throwing any shade or slighting the game and its art direction or anything like that but that looks like an achievable art style. It doesn't look mm -hmm. like it's crushing God of War, The Last of Us. No, and, and there's Sony jank can, in that game. And yes, I don't, and, I, and if, fine, I know. nobody cares. Fine. And if Sony can lean in that direction with their AAA single player story stuff, we'll have fun with it and it won't cost them $300 million. I, right. And I'm looking at games like Mod Nation Racers and, and, uh, and the, uh, um, what was that other racing series, MotorStorm. They ran like shit on the PlayStation 3 because they took forever to load and the frame rates were capped at 30 frames per second or whatever. Bring those to the PlayStation 5. Those were excellent games. And well, you know, you know what? The, I, I hear I, I agree only. I only disagree with that with one caveat, which is yeah. I think Helldivers got it right finally for Sony in that. If you're not going to spend a lot of money, that's fine, but you still have to be commercial. You still have to appeal to your base at a conceptual level because something like right. Mod Nation Racers, it's super cute. It was fun, blah, blah, blah. N no average PlayStation gamer. Sony's never sold well to family audiences like Puppeteer never sold. And even the last Ratchet wasn't that big of a success. That's you got to so go back to Jack though, one man. and two. What's that? Yeah, that's that's so reductive to think like that. And that's big, big, a big part of the problem on shaping what the market is. Like if you're right. just going to be in this bracket and in this bracket and in this bracket over and over again, where's your growth? Where's your systemic kind of. I'm not saying they you know, shouldn't try to keep cracking the nut. I'm just saying that if should. you look at hell divers, the lesson isn't just lean into some jank and low budget at times. It's make sure if you're going to, if you're doing that, at least if you yeah. want to sell to the audience you have now, it yeah. still has to be in a commercial genre uh, right. versus something that's like, cause a lot of times they'll lean into the low budget, but it's arty farty stuff. And I, I love the arty farty stuff, Me too. but the arty farty stuff ain't going to sell. Does do that. Exactly. You know, so can but we get would, some audience I questions? Sell. Here? I think they would they sell some of those sold. historically. I mean, you can't, I mean, you, I wish you were right. Look, one of my favorite games of all time is what remains of Edith Finch. That was, that was created by or funded by and supported by Sony Santa Monica until they canceled it. And oh, Annapurna yeah. picked it up because Sony's like, we love this, but this isn't going to make us enough money. Right. Um, I mean, they don't, you know, they, they sell for the little indie developer, but for Sony to put all their effort into it, it, it seems like it's not worth it. Right. You want to, you want to zero in on what the biggest question mark about what, what Sony is doing and how they've really kind of 
messed up an opportunity to make billions is putting what is? dreams on every platform. It's so like, dumb. It's like so Re dumb. Roblox is sitting there cleaning a house, just ripping I don't off under all kinds dude, of Dude, what do you, what do you know that I don't know about what the fuck they were smoking? Because I there are two things with that. One is the three things. The availability on other platforms, specifically PC, the yep. ability to launch those games without having to fucking own dreams, which is fucking ridiculous, yep. because most yep. people don't want to build games. So let them, you know, and the ability to monetize and yep. the ability to use the mouse and keyboard instead of the fucking stupid peripheral move controllers. I, what do you think the problem was? Because this is not some brilliant idea we're having in real time, Victor. They have no. to have discussed this. What do you think? made them say no i think they they've built this this uh architecture of selling hardware and software on uh, this kind of vertical climb and it's worked and worked and worked and sometimes it stumbles and sometimes it's but so much of the history of sony is tied to the, the that exact pattern and they do take big bets and big risks and i love sony for doing that but we're in a different world now. And yep. I think the minute it's not even just the PC. I think if, if you've got young kids, they're growing up with iPads and they're understanding manipulation on right. uh, three space screens and, and things. And Roblox became this, this, you know, $45 billion phenomenon because yep. of its access and its availability and it, and you know, it's, it's ease of use and ability yeah. to make money, not a lot of money. And it's yeah. got issues with its monetization, but you can fucking, build a career if you're making yeah. games in um it, what was it the uh the the couple quarters back epic didn't make as much money as they thought because they had such money they had to pay out to the creators of unreal engine and fortnite that were yeah. making content for fortnite that they they didn't anticipate people were going to play those creator levels as often as they did and as much as they did yeah. um it's it's an amazing incentive. Why would I spend all that time learning dreams if I can learn Unreal Engine 5 or fucking Roblox on my iPad? Yeah, and dreams is just an amazing product. It is. I mean, we're like when you see the, it's it takes stunning. effort. It's not easy. Sony and Mo Media Molecule probably could find ways to uh, make it easier for people and give them lots of playable little instances and bits and things. It it just baffles me. You know, it's it is this access. Uh, depriving people of it, of access to things that just baffles me with video games. That's why I applaud Microsoft trying a different way, yeah. you know? And I also applaud Nintendo stubbornly saying, nope, this is what we do. And we're, we're not about the hardware and, you know, we'll release 19 IP experiences <laughs> that we pay for in one year. And it's like, what? How do you well, have all of those things out there? Because when you focus on what the medium is, which is gameplay, and everything yeah. else takes a back seat. It's yep. not too hard. I mean, it's hard, but it's a different kind of hard. Um, good stuff. Thank you, Victor. I'm going to go to the audience if that's cool with you. Yeah, of course. Let's see what they say. Scott Woodford says, uh, Jaffe and Victor, hope you're both doing well. That's not a question. It's a comment, and it's a nice one. Thank you, buddy. Uh, yeah. Richard, thank you for the super chat. He says, Victor, I watched your show as a kid. We got it on our only channel by antenna. My only access to gaming content as a kid. Much love. Yeah. Isn't that nice? That's a nice, nice thing to fucking hear. Very sweet, man. Talks Mod, welcome to the Diet Soda Soldiers. Thank you, buddy. Living Legend says, Victor, good to see you on the stream. I missed the EP show from the early 2Ks. You and Brandon Jones were huge parts of my childhood. Look at this. These are people yeah. paying money just to say they love uh, you. It's not even questions they want to answer. They're just, isn't sweet. that great? And I love Brandon too. And and uh, he is he's an awesome, genuine, just good person. You know, yeah. uh, it's very, very cool. And honestly, that's a lot of the interactions that I have in, in real life, you know, and, and uh, I, I, I'm very, very grateful. It's unbelievable. You know? I'm sure you were watching, but did you know, like how, how, how soon did you know the new G4 relaunch wasn't going to work? Uh, immediately. And, and I was talking with them and, and, um, I did not get a good vibe off of the conversations. There was, um, uh, you know, I don't want to throw people under the bus, but there was a level of arrogance. And, and I think what people misunderstand about what I have put out into the world with the, these awesome teams is I have learned how to build things with an awesome team. You know, I've, I've learned a lot of hard lessons. I've learned a lot of what nots to do, you know, what nots to do or whatever. How do you get right, 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 right. Uh, and I, I, we've done the stumbling and 
I, I think that it, with the broadcasters that I've talked with, many of them have been building their resumes and their, um, you know, shows. Cause I've been talking to people all the way along. Right. Um, they're trying to create their footprint and their sort of take on what they're going to green light to win the accolades based on that. What they seem to miss is, is the, I'm not pitching them me, you know, I'm pitching what I've learned, you know, I'm, and that's what I expressed to G4. And then I saw them systematically make every stupid, expensive mistake that they should not have made. And I, I knew it was destined for failure and irrelevancy. And now I, I get asked about G4 and it's like, I don't even want to talk about G4 because it's so tarnished and yeah. such a shadow of what it was and the value yeah. held that it just makes me angry. You know, what a waste of time and effort and money that whole experience was. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It wasn't satisfying to watch. That's for sure. Um, yeah. Yeah. Have you found it more difficult these days to get the access that you enjoy because companies can basically curate their own message and put it up on the internet without the conduit of having to go to the press? Um, it, 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 you know, I, I think that there should be both. I think okay. that they should do that. I think that they should always be, um, uh, you know, respectful of the, uh, uh, the technologies and the abilities that they have out there. And, um, uh, the communities that they're building and utilize those tools in an honest way. Um, and I think that there's lots and lots of value out of those conversations, but I also think, um, that there's a tremendous amount of value from an editorial objective kind of viewpoint coming in and finding out about these decisions and these choices and asking from a genuine place of curiosity and, uh, you know, trying to, open it up a little bit more. So I think that there, there definitely should be a bit of both, but, but I have, have you noticed that. a little resistance now because they have their own ability to reach the consumer oh, yeah. directly. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, and, uh, I think that's also been a dangerous slope for, because what expressing outside of your circle does is that you expose this automatically to a new group of people. And I think that the right. industry has a, a tendency to think we've hit the ceiling. You know, we've, we sell 20 million units of call of duty a year. That's the most we're ever going to do. We can bank on that. We can all make our bonuses based on that. We can hit our quotas. We hit our stock prices. Everything is that that's as best as we're ever going to do. And that's enough, you know? And then I've, I hear, cause we have friends across the business like crazy that there'll be, uh, you know, internal fights based on, 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 uh, marketing budgets on games being made from one company and this company, this marketing team will fight with this marketing team and fight for allocation of dollars and they won't talk to each other and there'll be bitter feuds. And it's like, what the hell are, are you doing? You know, like most people don't play video games. Most people right. don't play them. They don't give a shit about them. Most people don't, they don't know anything about it. They're busy with their lives. We as a, a collection of enthusiasts in this space should do everything that we can to be inclusive for more people and tell more people that they should pay attention and not fight amongst ourselves as already diehard fans of this stuff to, in, in, you know, argue because you like this and you don't like that. What a waste of energy. We need more people in so the games get cooler and more varied and more interesting. And, and we have more, uh, you know, aspirational creators out there building things that excite us, you know? Sorry. Uh, one moment. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hey, give me two seconds. I'll be right there. Are you at the door? Okay. I, I, uh, you got to go. I, that's the that's the cleaning lady. Let me just run through these fast questions real quick. Because okay. I, I just want to circle back to the G4 thing because I think that some of the oh, Okay, I'm going to go saying, open the door. Continue okay. speaking. Okay. To these to the audience right. is watching. I'm I just got a letter inside. In the Dave Take Gaffey it over, Power Hour. Okay. Uh, I, uh, I was reflecting a little bit on what I said about G4 and I don't want that to be construed as that the, the people building the things I, you know, I, I know how hard it is to build things. They were doing the best that they could. It's the people deciding on 
expenditures and you know how it was going to be out there and what it was going to serve and how it was all marketed that's what pisses me off it's the it's the the the, the uh i don't know the corporate sort of established architecture stuff that put g4 out there very disappointed in the way that that was all put together but i also you know that they didn't have any favors for how that g4 thing came together during the pandemic you know like that was also really awful timing for them to build a show where everybody had to work in masks and come in and i'm sure there were lots of outbreaks and all that other stuff but uh yeah very disappointed and part of it for sure was like why didn't we get a chance to show them what we could do with them, you know? Um, so, yeah. <laughs> All right. Sorry about that. Living Legend says, shout out from Toronto. Thank you, sir. He also says, I miss Toronto for my glory 90s childhood. Best years ever. I miss the MK Arcades, Genesis, SNES, all retro. Awesome. Man, how I wish we could go back in time. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of that out there, bro. And that's why I wanted to work with PMP because, you know, they serve that community. Yeah, it's a really cool, I know, like I said, I'm really excited now because I did not even know yeah. this was a thing and they have a whole collectibles and home goods. And I went from being a uh, total collectible junkie, like clearly you are, to being yeah. a minimalist. And as I'm getting older now, I'm starting to get back to being, I want to own shit again. Uh, yeah. so I'm kind of like, I want to go back and buy all the shit that I gave away. Cause I'm like, I'm a minimalist now. It's like, well, I, well, I, I teeter back and forth. You know, I'm not a huge, um, uh, hater of digital access to games. I know that a lot of people sure. are, but I've got a huge collection of physical stuff, obviously. And I like the immediacy and the simplicity of having a library that I can just jump into. And as a reviewer of content, <laughs> you know. I used to wait for FedEx packages like crazy when we were making the show. And, uh, you know, so many of our deadlines were like, oh, my God, just get this goddamn game here. Let's go because we got to play nice. it and we got to shoot this week. And and uh, that was such a stress. And now that stress is uh, very different. Now it's right. It's uh, it's you, yeah. you know, it's in an email. Right. So it's a lot easier these days. Um, OK, cool. Uh, let's see. Um Video Games Plus is a great California site, says Legend. Any anyone who shops at Toy Rot Retro in Milton, he's just spending money to talk to people. Uh, I have a ton <laughs> of E3 picks Victor can have, says David Goodrich, who is the designer of the. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Goodrich. Uh, he's the he worked with me on Twist Metal Black, but he was the designer of Vigilante Eight, Vigilante oh, Eight Two. He says he's right got a bunch of three pictures if you want them. Uh, to put up or have or for your uh, stuff. Uh, thanks, good rich. Um, Twisted Sith, thank you, buddy. He says, "What in the actual fuck is going on here?" All right, thank you, buddy. Um, <laughs> all right, Victor, uh, I could talk to you for another couple of hours on this stuff, but I, you've given us so much time. Uh, is there anything else you want to talk about? Or I, I'd love to ask you about Sweet Baby Ink if you got the time. If not, we can do it later because people I, I mean, are always I, upset honestly, about that. I hadn't even heard about that until uh, somebody mentioned it on, under a uh, the Suicide Squad review that I did, and right. I didn't even know anything about it. So I, now I you didn't really like Suicide Squad, right? No, I, I didn't. I I liked the um, some of the story bits and the and the mm -hmm. way that they put it together, and I thought that it was really building to, to something um cool and it was starting to pull me in and then i got to the end of it it's like eh, you know um i didn't so hate you it fi you finished it right yeah you i didn't know. hate yeah i finished it and played some of the end game stuff and it's like okay i, I you know i there wasn't enough pulling me to want to continue with it and i right. honestly didn't think that the single player story was as fun and engaging as the avengers single player element was i actually really oh, liked wow. what I... crystal d did interesting and with that and i think that if crystal d had the opportunity to continue on with another game like i think they would have destiny to'd it you know like they would have gone up a, a level um but it's tough to build these things and have any sense of completion and finality obviously but they're about stories and characters that we read through these stories or we see these films and these movies and these shows and there are arcs and it's over and we put them away and then we go to something else. And if you're attaching this business model to that kind of thing, all about locking you forever, not only is that really counterintuitive to the rest of your your portfolio and the rest of the work that the industry is putting out there, but it's also diluting the value in your love and affection for these 
properties and these characters. It, is you know? it though? Because isn't that what comic books are? I mean, they sell you an arc and then they want you to come back for another one and another one and another one. Uh, maybe it's just poorly they, done. They are, but they're very they, conceivably. And when they work the best, they go in a totally different direction and they show right. you a whole different perspective. And by their nature, these live service video games really just find a way like they they serve you the same experience but it's backwards now or it's a, it's purple this time or it, in, the, in the case of uh, suicide squad everything would be orange you know or something like that <laughs> right purple was already overused right and, and you know it's just not as easy to pivot in a different direction with a video game as it is that's in a right comic a comic story. yeah no yeah. i there used to be a comic series when i was a kid that was like it would this is how fluid it was it was the it was a challenge i think they called it the dc challenge you ever read this where the writer at the end of of comic episode or issue one would leave it on a cliffhanger and a whole new team would come in for issue that's two amazing. It yeah. was really cool, you know. That's how fluid it was and quick it was back then. But uh, yeah, I actually enjoyed that game more than I thought. I I, yeah. I enjoyed Suicide Squad quite a bit. Uh, although I can't I can't fine. kill yeah I couldn't kill Brainiac yeah. though because it it was just you know they have that thing where you if you if you quit and then you reboot you have to play that whole fucking section yeah. again and yeah. then that you sucks. fight Brainiac and by that time I'm like dude yeah it's my nap time I'm old fuck you yeah. Yeah. anyway no yeah, all right that was a little uh, frustrating at the end it was it was but all right victor thank you buddy uh i really could talk for a while with you but i i the time you've given has been great yeah oh i would love that if you would be open for it i would love a part yeah. two reach out anytime and, and i'll reach out to you to come on mine and uh good and don't forget lit. if you're watch That's the, it go ahead oh i was gonna say uh go well first off go to pnpgamesonline.com because if you're like me you never heard of it it's very very cool yep. check but them out as importantly there and on Victor's channel uh, at YouTube, which is not electric. It, what is it? It's EPN, EPN or TV. Yeah, EPN, EPN TV. came out of us doing two daily shows and a podcast and right. other things. It was too big to just say one electric playground because we had all right. of these other brands and things. So we called it EPN Electric Playground Network. And uh, so it's upn.com slash EPN TV. And starting March 23rd, you can start the journey with us with the very first episode of the Electric Playground. And Victor will be watching it live with you guys. And what time is it? Is it a morning? Nine o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Every like the show. Saturday. Like, yeah, Pacific. So it'll be noon Eastern. But every okay. week at the same time, we'll premiere it and we'll chat. And uh, you'll laugh at the fact that I'm wearing the same sweater in <laughs> every goddamn episode <laughs> and, did you know uh, you were doing that the gilligan's island it's dude, just like i didn't know shit man i was very young and like freaked out that we were making some girl television. told you you look good in the sweater and then oh yeah. we're in the fucking yeah. sweater again <laughs> that's all right whatever works man oh man but yeah, march 23rd TV. 9 a.m california time yep. don't forget i'll be watching as well all right victor Put thank you buddy and thank you guys for yep. watching i will talk to you later bye everyone victor bye -bye. when i end this we're just going to end because it's on uh, StreamYard. So seriously, okay. off on off the record, whatever. Thank you, bud. I appreciate it, and I'll talk oh, to you this soon. Was fun man. Thanks for All having right. me. All right, thank on. you, Victor. Take All care. right, bye, guys. Bye -bye. Maybe I'm still on. I am still on. Thank you guys for watching. Uh, and uh, yeah, I'll be back later. I might go see Dune two today. What do you think of that? That I just said. Haven't seen it yet. I was going to do a Gavin and games today, but, uh, you know, that's a long stream. So maybe we'll, uh, you know, maybe we'll do, uh, I don't fucking know what I'm talking about now. Maybe we'll do a stream or not, but I definitely want to go see Dune too. So maybe I'll do that. All right, fellas, be well, be safe. And, uh, I'll see you guys soon. Bye everyone.